You guys what ready? What is this? You guys ready? Everybody ready? We looking at me right here. Right here. Who's ready? I'm ready. You ready? We are ready. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is your boy Shin, the legend, baby. And we are here with our first ever When Legends Talk. And the star of the show, Lemon Pops. Say hello, Lemon Pops. Hello, hello, man. How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself, man? Doing well. I didn't know this was called Legend Talks. I like that I until literally right now when it hit me. I'm like, whoa. I didn't realize this was that kind of pedestal I was getting put on. Hey, you're the first one, man. The first one has to be the greatest one. <laughs> and will always be. All right. Um, so if you guys haven't known, like um Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to interview Lemon Pop. So we're going to go through his life story. It's going to be kind of a loose interview because basically it's him telling his story, you know. And once we get one question in, it's going to hopefully it continues on and on and on. And um, if you guys have any questions or anything you want to talk to Lemon about, like any questions you want to ask him, we'll wait to the end. All right. All right. So. First of all, Lemon, we're going to start with the good, man. We're going to start with nothing but good news from childhood until now. So go ahead and let's tell the chat um, some of the some of your happy memories from, let's say, from birth to like 10. Happy memories. Man, I was sitting on my porch today thinking about that, going over the list you sent me. And I'm like, man, happy memories. That's like, I don't know. There, there's, there's like some, you know, going to see my dad as a kid was super awesome. Going up to, to catch can and traveling all over Oregon, Washington and stuff like that. That was pretty fun. Um, going fishing, man. This one time I was fishing up in catch can. I caught this halibut. I was probably like eight years old and it was maybe like the second time I'd ever been out on the ocean fishing. And so I, I, I got my, my reel, I got my, my pole, you know, those things like a foot and a half, two feet taller than I am. Man, and I all of a sudden I get a bite <laughs> and this freaking um, halibut got a hold of my hook and just about pulled me over the edge of the boat. My dad managed to grab onto me and like hold me on because I was gone, man. This thing like just yanked me. It was a 125 pound fish. And I was like... I don't know, 45 pounds, 50 pounds at the time. So I think, dude, when it caught me, like I was gone. It was like, it just, it was swimming and I was gone. Oh, man. So, yeah. But like, I don't know. It was just like fun stories like that. A lot of fun stories from Alaska, man. Lots. Um, back Those to are some the, of my best memories. Um, back to the fish thing. Um, did you have a life jacket on? I, I, I just want to see something. Did you have a life jacket on? I don't think I did. <laughs> no, I was like, what, 1989? Like, everybody's drinking beer and, you know, See, I driving think, blind. Yeah, I think with the older generations, like, we did a lot of reckless things that people would look at us today and be like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Dude, okay. a perfect example of that was this, uh, we went on this field trip. So at the end of eighth grade, when I was going to school up in, up in Ketchikan, Alaska, okay. uh, end eighth grade, this is something that you never find anywhere else in the United States, to my knowledge. Like I've never heard of any school doing something like this. So the end of eighth grade, you know, like most schools would do like a water park adventure, you know, like a roller coaster ride, or like, I don't know, like they take you somewhere, you do a thing, you celebrate graduation, you know, it's cool. Yeah. Well, eighth grade for alaska they're like cool we're gonna take you on a week-long survival trip where we drop you on an island with one adult and you're not allowed to bring food you can fit what fits in a coffee can and we'll be back on saturday dude so they load us up on these boats they take us on a coast guard boat over to a, an island like a way because the town's on one island like and there, there are okay. other islands there's like hundreds of other islands out there but none of them like are populated they're just abandoned empty um and yeah they take us over to this other island drop us off like 45 kids one teacher and they're like cool uh call us if you need something you know before cell phones <laughs> uh yeah i think we had a radio or something like that so yeah think about that man just like 40 kids running around on an island like bears one deer teacher? You know? one teacher though one teacher yeah no guns no guns whatsoever Dude, at one point, a uh, bear was, like, messing with the edge of our camp, you know, like, look, looking around, and, like, 12 of us got together and, like, ah! 
<laughs> it's this bear, you know, 12 people scare off the bear. <laughs> There's a lot of us. So yeah, think about that. Though. Think about this, the, the sort of bubble that we live in nowadays where a parent wouldn't even let their kid go outside on a bike nowadays, hardly, let alone drop them off on an island. It's definitely a different generation, man. But <laughs> I can't get past like a whole, like 45 kids, one teacher, and y'all just fending for yourselves. Like, yeah, what dude, the- I had fishing line. I had, what did I have, man? I had whatever would fit in a coffee cup, which, you know, I stuffed like two oatmeal things in there, but that was like all I could fit. So after the first afternoon, I was out of food. Um, and yeah, you're out there like on the rocks trying to catch fish all day. And I ended up eating sea cucumber. Um, we did have like one of the local native tribes came over and like fed us whale and seal, you know, cause they could actually hunt those legally. Um, yeah. So I got to try some of that, but like for the most part, man, you're starving out there, but this is the cool part. So I got, I got an award at the end of this trip okay. for uh, black market, black market award. Um, <laughs> a lot of people smuggled food, man. A lot of people snuck in food out there, you know, cause it, it, most people ain't want to starve for a whole week. So I went around like first day, second day, found everybody who had food and started trading for it. I'm like, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you like these pair of pants, you know? Oh, your pants got torn, man. I got a sewing kit. You know, like I give you sewing kit, you give me the food. I know, but like all the food on the whole fucking <laughs> island by day three. And I started, I started selling it, man. I'm like 20 bucks. You want a Kit Kat? 20 bucks. You want <laughs> what y'all, you want, man? Y'all listening to yeah. this shit, right? Y'all listening to this man, <laughs> Black Market. All right. New nickname for Lemon Pops. That's, that's what his Twitch name should have been. Black Market. Dude, hustling, hustling. <laughs> it's been a part of my life since I was a kid. Like you got to make money somehow. That's what kind of brought me to streaming eventually. I mean, how many kids did not make it? There's 45 kids. How many kids did not make it? I honestly don't know. I don't remember anybody leaving. Like, I don't think anybody left. If they did, you know, we didn't know about it. Mm. But there weren't a whole lot of us. And I don't think a couple of kids tried to build a raft. (laughs) That, that, That flopped. They tied a bunch of logs together. Like, we're going home. Fuck this. And uh, built this raft, and finally the teacher's like, listen, you can't actually take a raft across the ocean, okay? Like, it was cool that you were doing it, you know, it's fun and all, but, like, you can't just go float 16 miles across the ocean. You're not doing that. I mean, but so. it's survival training. They gotta survive. Right? It's like, if yeah. you, if you're I thought a, it was a good idea. One teacher, how the hell are you gonna keep an eye out on 45 students? Oh, I mean, there was no way. There was no, no way. No we were way. all over the place, man. No. We're scattered over like two miles, two square miles of place. Like I, people are all over. I would have guaranteed yeah. this day and age, half those kids would have came back pregnant. Not putting <laughs> it out there. Putting eighth grade. There. Eighth grade. Hey, dude. <laughs> I already knew two girls that were pregnant in eighth grade in that class. See. They, I mean, 13, they got pregnant. 14, they got pregnant. I mean, that's all people did in catch can was drugs and sex. Like, that was all there was to do, man. There's nothing. You're on a tiny island a thousand miles from the nearest, like, city. Um, yeah, there ain't nothing to do out there. It's a different way of life. It's it's one that a lot of people just have never experienced where, like, a lot of people have been to, like, a rural place and maybe even some people live in a rural place. But, like, to be in a rural place that's also literally like four or 500 miles from the nearest like cell phone tower, you know, mm-hmm. like any sort of help. If you, if you need to call for like a real hospital rescue, it's like 10 hours round trip to get you somewhere. It's yeah. You're out there on your own, man. So okay. people live different. Okay. Um, sounds like um, from already like standing like you had a lot of um, good times with your dad. Is that um, correct? If that's fair, John. Um, yeah. What about personally? Um, yeah. What about your mom? You had good trips with your mom, or is that for later yeah. on? Well, I mean, mom did her best to raise me. You know, she really did. She she. Not everybody's perfect. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But uh, yeah, no, she she. Uh, she raised me to be who I am today, for whatever that's worth, or at least partially, you know, made me who I am today. It's like, as long as you raise so. your child to be a good person in this world, you you done your job, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now I'm taking care of her, so it's a different different right. change. Some some people don't do that, man. We're, we're happy that you do that. Um, 
All right. So, um, what 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 was Little Lemon like? Like, what was your hobbies? Like the things you like to do, the things you like to like. One of those things, like your hobbies, that thing that just gets you. Oh. Man, when I was a kid, I was such a dork. Like I got. <clears throat> I got pictures of me when I was like eight years old. Not even pictures. I got a videotape sitting on the shelf over there of of me. I think I was it was my eighth birthday, seventh or eighth birthday. And I'm wandering around the zoo up in Anchorage and I'm sucking my thumb. And my dad's like, what are those? I'm like, caca heads. I was like a little dweeb, man. Uh, <laughs> that was like third grade. You know, we're talking third grade. I was still like that. I was, I was really stunted, let's say. But um yeah i i was like building things i loved legos that was that was my biggest thing i I used to play legos a lot i like engineering i like making i like creating always have okay what's your um what's like one of your best lego things that um that you built oh i used to try to make indestructible boats where where it was literally just like all the Legos possible stuff together into like a boat shape sort of so that I could throw it at things and it wouldn't break. I don't know. I had weird. Ho- now that you got me thinking about it, I had a very strange way of finding entertainment as a kid, man. I, I think I built um freaking firehouse. That one sticks out to me. That was back when I was like five or six. Oh, you would build something Legos like that. Five or six. Like I was 13 and couldn't build a damn thing. Oh, dude, my my dad got me this Connects roller coaster set. It was for 13 and up, and I was fucking six. I was six years old. Sorry if I'm swearing. Try not to. No, no, go ahead. (laughs) Six years old, and he gets me this thing for 13-year-olds, and I was so frustrated, but it was another one of those opportunities in life where it's like I wanted it, and he got it for me, and then I was whining because I couldn't figure out how to make it work. You know, like I couldn't figure it out, and it was one of those situations where it's like, do you want to play with it or not, you know? How bad do you want to play with this toy? You wanted this roller coaster. Make it work. Figure it out. And so I had to figure it out. So I, I had a lot of like tough love lessons like that taught to me in life. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> truthfully, like I, I was never like the toy type of person. Like you know, it was video games all the way. <laughs> and, you know, look at us now. <laughs> <laughs> um yes sir so what what's what's hit a good what was you known for in elementary like fighting it, fighting <laughs> <laughs> dude i got in fights all the time i don't know outside that i was always i don't know it depends on how you want me to approach this because like a, a lot of that was like i got in trouble a lot you know, I didn't have a very good home life at the time, so I was making, I was doing some dumb stuff. In second grade, I punched a teacher in the face. Um, they threw me out of school for that, and then I got let back in. I kept getting in fights, like, but I was, I don't know, I just, I didn't have any tolerance. I didn't have any, like, social skills with dealing with, with conflict other than violence, you know? Like, the only way I knew to solve problems was, like, hit them, you know? Somebody's doing something you don't like. You 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 make them stop, you know. And it led to me getting in a lot of trouble, and it it led to a lot of people having a really negative opinion of me, which created social isolation too. You know. Okay, so um, um I would I would say that carried on with you into middle school and high school too. Yeah. So by by fourth grade, I got expelled in fourth grade, and so I started getting homeschooled. And then from halfway through fourth grade through the end of fifth grade, I got homeschooled. Um, and then in sixth grade, when I came back, man, that was like a, a complete mind fuck. You know, I walk in and when I left school, everybody's a fourth grader, you know. And when I, I come back, everybody's like start puberty and like getting taller. And like people are like, he was my boyfriend last year. And now that's my boyfriend this year. And I'm like, you have boyfriends now. Like when I left, y'all were, you know, playing Barbies. So it it was like a major shock for me there too, but I did I made friends with a couple of people, a couple of the wrong people, a couple of the right people. Um, I, God, I made friends with this one kid who turned out to be a complete psycho, like complete psycho, like like I I don't know, like Kip Kinkle psycho, like kid, uh, uh, salad fingers psycho. 
like yeah he <laughs> so he used to like to go behind his house after school and like chop up snakes alive and like stick them on hot nails and stuff like that and you know like torture animals and he um came to school one day soaked in gasoline and was gonna light himself on fire to like protest something or another so like this kid was nuts like like oh, truly yeah, nuts that, that kid that kid is... <laughs> <laughs> it's sixth grade man yeah. sixth grade this kid and so I got arrested because I knew he'd been doing it. I didn't know it was illegal. I didn't, I didn't have any part in it whatsoever, but I knew he was doing it and they arrested me for it too, for not reporting it. So I was looking at 30 years at 11 years old for animal abuse. Oh, um, wow. And, you know, eventually, you know, we talked to the judge, they didn't have any evidence against me. And of course I didn't do anything. So I, I was going to get off, but on a condition of me getting off, they wanted me to testify against him. And I said, no, you know, cause I don't do that. And so then they subpoenaed me. Well, they subpoenaed me while I was at school and they told his parents and they told my parents, but they didn't tell me, but his mom called the school and told him that I was going to be testifying against him. So that day on lunch break, we got on lunch break and I'm like walking between the, the lunch room and the main building for the school. There's like a little vestibule area. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Him and his buddy grab me and they grab me and like push me against the wall and they look at each other. They don't even address me. They just look at each other and like, OK, so you're going to stab him and I'm going to take the knife from you and then I'm going to stab you. And then we'll say that he stabbed you. You took the knife and fought back. OK, OK. And then they both started coming at me and I was like, what? <laughs> like, no, like, what the fuck? What the so I, I started fighting. The teacher showed up. They pulled us all apart. And um, they got the story, you know, because he was going to kill me because I was going to testify against him. Like, this kid was nuts. He was absolutely nuts. So I made friends with some of the wrong people. I, I didn't like have a very good judge. nuts, too. Damn. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, the other guy. I don't even think the other guy went to the school. I think the other guy was, like, 20. Like, he, he was not even a kid. Wow. Or he was a high schooler or something like that. I remember him being way older. Wow. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> crazy. That that is crazy, um, so we're gonna move on. Um, you had a you had a brief um, military stay, right? Or... I did. I was in the National Guard for seven years. Okay, tell us tell us about that. I don't seven years. That's seven not, years, that's yeah. Not brief. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, that seven brief. years definitely not too brief. <laughs> um, Man, that was a trip, you know, from from going through basic training to going to my unit. Um, yeah, so I, I joined the military initially because my wife was pregnant and I needed money. <laughs> that was really it. I wish there was some like noble reason or, or something like that. You know, like I'd, I'd always considered serving in the military, but when it came down to it, I was like, yo, they got a signing bonus for 10 grand and I got a baby on the way. I got to do what I got to do. Look, so, you know, I mean, as far as it goes, like from some of the other stories I heard, because I did Marine Corps for four years, like some people join because it's either jail or military and you're my staff yeah. sergeant. Like, what the fuck you mean? Like, right. You were in the Marines? Yeah, I was. I did. I did. Years. Dude, I always forget that. <laughs> I, I thought you told me that before. But yeah. Well, <clears throat> so, you know, man, yeah. like. No matter what you come in for, what you get trained to be is something different, exactly. you know, and you get that you get that sense of of selfless service and that sense of, of self-sacrifice and, and knowing what it really means to to be willing to give your life for somebody else. Um, yeah. yeah. And that that, you know, it changes you. It does change you. And after seven years in, I yeah, it was it was a. For everything the military gave me, that's the way I always describe it. For every single awesome, amazing experience they gave me, every bit of benefit, every every everything they gave me. Because they give you a lot, man. They give you money. They give you a house. They give you food. They give you, like, everything. All this opportunity. They, for everything they give you, they also take every single bit back out of you that they can. Exactly. Like, they will, they they will, will. take all of it back. <clears throat> so, it's, it's a fair trade, you know? You... Is yeah. it fair? Is it really fair? <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's got to do it, man. Somebody's got to got to serve. Somebody has to be willing to step up and do that. Exactly. And 
at that point in my life, I was like, man, I, I, I look around to all the other people I know. And it's one of those situations where it's like, dude, I wouldn't ask any of them to take a bullet for me, you know, like not, I would never ask anybody else to be that person so that I could sit back on my ass and do nothing. Yeah. So yeah, that was my mentality. I'm like, then it's gotta be me. You know, I have to be the one. All right. So, um, you probably remember some stuff from boot camp. Favorite boot camp story. Oh man. So this guy, you know how you're always supposed to secure your locker, right? Uh in, in basic training, boot yeah. camp. Yeah. So you get in this situation where all right, for people out there who don't know too, when you're in basic training, they are uh absolutely one hundred percent up your ass about every single detail. Like attention detail is one of the biggest things because in combat, that's what keeps you alive, man. Like if you forget because you're in a panic or you're tired or you're hungry or you're thinking about your girlfriend, if you forget to load your freaking magazine properly, you know, or, or something like that, you're going to die and other people are going to die because of that. So it's important. It's a very important skill to have that drilled into you. But, uh, in basic, one of the ways they teach you those skills of discipline and attention details by making sure that you do basic tasks like lock your locker when you're not at your locker. So if you get to leave your locker, or if you get to lock your locker up, usually what would happen is if a drill sergeant saw it, they'd toss all your stuff all over the whole building, out the windows, everything, and you'd have to go spend hours picking it up while they chased you. Um, so this one day, I went to go take a shower, and I came back from the shower, and I realized my locker's locked, which made me realize that my locker was unlocked when I left. I forgot to lock my locker. So my locker's locked. Uh, and my mattress is gone and I'm like, dude, what is go <laughs> like who man, who did it? You know, who did it? And so I try to open up my locker and my freaking lock won't work. The combo won't work. And I'm like, somebody else put their lock on here. So I had to go find whoever it was to put a lock on my locker, have them come over, put their combo in, unlock it. And when I open this thing up, there is this buck naked private stuffed in there with my mattress He's he's got his legs around it like this on my mattress and he's looking out at me naked. He's like in my locker, and, dude, some of the like nonsense crap. So I found out that somebody it was somebody else's idea to do this. Right. It was one of my other bunk mates there. It was his idea to do this whole setup. So he was in the showers. So I took my or I took his mattress and I drug that thing down the hall into the showers to him. And I'm like, yo, bro, you forgot your mattress. And he's in there naked and soap. He's like, what the, like, trying to keep his mattress out of there, you know, as I'm, like, shoving it into the showers with him, water coming in, <laughs> bunch of naked people everywhere. I'm like, come on, man. You want, you forgot this. So, yeah, like, there there were some, like, bright sides of skirt around, you know. Um, but in terms of, like, you know, noble honor stories, like, man, it was, it was nuts doing things like Nick at night, you know, where you got live fire going over your head and you're crawling through the sand and barbed wire and the flares going off. I mean, it was, it was insane rolling through dude, doing things like a 15 mile ruck march starting at midnight, you know, and you're, you're marching for like five hours until you're like delirious. You got a hundred pound pack on, you don't even know where you are. You don't know your name. You can hardly see anybody around you. And then like all of a sudden, there's this SF unit doing its training, just like rolling between us as we're like marching along. And I'm like, what the, f like these guys ain't privates, you know, they got all their night vision on and they're all like camoed. They're actual soldiers, you know, like just slipping through our ranks undetected doing their own thing while we're out there doing our marches. Like there were, there were some, I don't know, really interesting stories getting tear gassed all the time. I mean, I'm sure you had that happen too. Man, CS gas. I wasn't, I wasn't a fan, but seeing the reactions between um, the other people was worth it. It was very. Wait, you guys didn't do CS gas? No, we did. But oh, okay. Seeing the reactions of other people was yeah, it was the worst. I was like, I'll take gas all day as long as I can see <laughs> this motherfucker right here, fucking dude. People out. running around just. <laughs> just not coming down because for people who don't know out there too like what cs gas does is it just turns it like di disables all the like blockers and your tear glands and and not nose and mucus and, and spit and all that stuff it just disables it your sweat glands so you just start dripping like maximum drippage from every single hole 
on top of the burning and everything like that. Oh, yeah. So it's got just like a weird chemical effect that makes you turn into a m- mucusy puddle. It's really gross. Um, but you know what I'm talking about, man. Like yeah. seeing people running around like that. Yeah. Have you done? Uh... But they gas us all the time, dude. Oh, damn. they gas us all the time. Yeah, we got as soon as we went through the gas chamber, like that was green light to gas us like <laughs> twice a day. Twice so they day. were chucking that stuff like can't yeah dude i'm not even kidding ever like all the time man we'd be waiting for buses and they'd be out there just like tear gas 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 as you're like trying to get your mask on yeah oh, oh man um have you done anything called the iron man for the gas show? iron man what's that um, what's that when you go in there without a mask and you just stay in there for one whole minute oh no no we didn't do that man <laughs> what is that like dude second i took my mask off i started dying like uh, in the gas chamber i took that thing off and and i st- <laughs> like i couldn't breathe you had to go in there for a minute no nah, um we had some people because i didn't volunteer for it i'm smarter than that <laughs> uh, but we yeah. had some people who's like you know what i'm the best of the best and blah 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 and we'll just say None of them made it past 30 seconds, at least in my unit. <laughs> 30 seconds? Dude. 30 seconds. Dude came out. Everything was, he's like, ah, and he was just <laughs> rolling on the ground. You know, like a cartoon character that's on fire? Oh, yeah. And just like this is like, oh, my God. And I was like looking oh, at him. Man. And I'm like, I know you're hurt. Like, you, you got to be hurt because these rocks that you're rolling on are like just as big as. They're like razors. Like just big fucking spearheads and like, mm-hmm. you, you're rolling on that shit like jesus christ like <laughs> like it's gonna put you out man like, you're not safe it yeah. ain't ending dude we had people go to the bathroom that was that was what got me <laughs> to, was to hear i heard we were eating lunch and from like a 100 yards away at the latrine i heard a scream just one singular ah! like that just high pitched and I was like, what? Oh, my God. He did. Like, he didn't wash his hands. That guy did not wash his hands before he went to the bathroom. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, oh dude. My goodness. Whew. That's not what you want. It's not. All right. No. So, um, <clears throat> let the good times roll. Um, your streaming career. We'll call it career now, right? We can call it that, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I um, suppose we could probably call it that. Let's let's name let's name a couple of the the greatest times in your streaming career, like the greatest moments, like you would never ever forget. Well, I mean, Musty dropping a thousand dollars is pretty nuts. Man, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Musty dropping a thousand dollars is pretty nuts. Like, I uh, the first two that come to mind are money, and I hate that. Like the fact that those are the two that come to mind first, but I mean, that's just crazy. Like musty, musty cow, like got a million subs on YouTube, came and dropped a thousand bucks. Like that's a pretty big story. All right. Like take us, take I, us yeah, through the motions. When you saw it, take us through the motion step by step. Dude. He said he was already in chat. That was the thing. Like, cause he, I was saying I was at like two hundred and fifty dollars out of out of a two hundred and fifty dollar goal for the the charity fund that that stream, and somebody said, "Hey, if you don't or like you should for a thousand or for five hundred bucks, you should shave your head," and I was like, "Okay, yeah, for five hundred bucks, I'll shave my head." And like as I said that, I think I think it was like right about then I just see a thousand dollar donation from Musty, and I'm like. Like what? <laughs> what are you doing, man? Like you, what is going on? So yeah, I'm like, yeah, I I gotta hold up my end of the bargain. Like we're shaving my head, you know, we're doing this. I, they, um, they, they were whispering to each other. He's like, hey, I, I I'm gonna say this, and you do this. You gonna cue it up, right? Well, I guess <laughs> I guess he had an issue. I think no, yeah, that's what it was. No, he actually had an issue. His card because he was doing a video. He was taking five thousand dollars and donating to five different streamers, and I was the fifth. Well, because he had already donated four thousand dollars to other people, when he went to do it for me, his card didn't go through, and so he said he was going to do it, and then it never happened. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, it's cool, man. Like you ain't got to come in here and lie and be an asshole. You know, it's it's fine. Like, thanks, Musty, for just <laughs> toying with me. Uh, no, but. 
yeah he finally got it to go through it it was like the least expected timing so it, it totally caught me off guard man i mean i've had i've had some crazy streams like honestly the whole period of of the summer 2018 was really awesome when i got to do all that casting for all those pro players like a lot of them are pro now you know first killer um lmr maton uh maton maton l omar maton uh yeah like calm calm went on heps like all these other guys that at the time were still like top players but not pro have have gone on to some of them make good money from playing rocket league you know it's really mm -hmm. cool to have gotten that opportunity to meet those guys and at the time i didn't even realize what i was getting you know like i didn't realize what that was going to do long term i was just like oh yeah they're gonna come by and that'll be it you know it's like you don't even think about it Okay, and um, you're pretty successful today. Right. You're alive, you're kicking, you're well, you're doing great. All right, so guys, we just got to know the good side of Lemon right now. You know, you know the, the things that you would probably see, but, you know, let's go ahead and talk about the things that we wouldn't hear Lemon probably open. Well, I don't know, because he's a very, you're a very open person, Lemon. Like, you know, you're a very open person. But, you know, like, there's a lot of questions that people wouldn't just come up and ask you because we see it as rude or stuff like that. So, um, we're going to go to the dark side, all right? Let's you go to the dark to... side, man. All right, you know, and we're going to start it, start it where it all begins. Childhood, man. Childhood. Childhood. <laughs> When um, yeah. I said a good part would probably be when um, you mentioned you started getting in a lot of fights and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, honestly, so much, so much of my childhood was just messed up to begin with, though, man. Like, from my, well, I think it was one of my first memories. I was, I was like two years old, and I remember my mom coming in to use my dad's bathroom. And he got out of bed and I don't know what happened, but he started just smashing her head into everything in the bathroom and just like off the sink and off the toilet. And there was blood everywhere. And like, yeah, like that was that was like the, the starting out stories, you know, like that was <laughs> that was like the first lasting memory I had as a kid. See, um, and, and then everything went from there. And like that, that's pretty traumatic seeming like you know most of the stories that you were talking about like involved your dad like all the good time stories involved your dad yeah you know my dad my dad was going through a lot of stuff and i i'm not forgiving him at all for what he did there but like honestly he was a vietnam war vet he had untreated ptsd he was doing coke they were both doing coke or or drugs of some kind and they both weren't making good life choices you know that was that's the gist of it and after my mom left he got his shit together and things changed you know okay. so he's definitely not the same person he was then all right so when mom left were you with dad or did you leave with mom no i left with her okay so yeah the story after that so now you're you're with mom you guys are on your own yeah so after that we moved in with my grandma you know and that was that was another one of those those moments in life where i had to have like a, a significant memory because this is one of those those first times in life that i learned about like willpower you know i was i was four years old my grandma had this creek running through her property she owned like two or three or four acres or something like that out in the country and she had a creek going through the property um with like these steam muddy banks you know like a deep cut gully thing uh, -huh. uh and i didn't know how to swim and one day i was walking along it and i fell in and this thing was like the water it was in spring i think and the water was super turbulent and started sucking me downstream i didn't know how to swim i was wearing my coat you know i had a bunch of clothes on and i just started grabbing for anything i could grab for you know i, I was just panicking and i grabbed some blackberry bushes and I managed to pull myself up kind of like up to my neck, you know, keep my head above water on these blackberry bushes. And I was looking up at this muddy bank that was just covered in blackberry bushes all the way to the top. And I, I dude, I, 
I don't know what came over me, but I drug myself all the way to the top, just like ripping and tearing and covering. I was so torn up from blood and everything else. Um, yeah, like it, it was one of those, not like a negative traumatic moment, but like like a positive one where something bad happened, but it taught me an important lesson in life about how, you know, there's nobody else to save you at certain points in life and you've got to learn to take care of yourself like and and being tested like that at a young age i think really kind of shaped who i am nowadays mm -hmm. all right so let's let's get into the fights like you said you was things weren't going good at home what was going on at home for you to get into fights in school like that well dude my stepdad my stepdad was super abusive um like in in a bunch of <laughs> like generally cruel and weird ways you know like one um i wasn't allowed to watch cartoons uh when him and my mom got together he said i couldn't go outside and play with my friends unless i worked on my writing every day and his idea of working on my writing was writing for ferdinand the friendly bull start to finish which is like a 45 page book so every day before I was allowed to go play with my friends, I had to write the entirety of Ferdinand the Friendly Bull, which usually by 7 or 8 p.m. I'd get to like page 13 or 15 and then that was it, you know, like so I never got to go outside. Um, this guy, he would always he was always making fun of me. He had this thing called the monkey box, which was uh -huh. this little box of mirrors. It, it was just like a little box of uh, it was like a little jewelry box, but it had mirrors on the inside. And every time I'd cry, he'd shove my head in it and make fun of how stupid I looked until, you know, he got bored of that and then would beat me more. Um, dude was just not a cool dude. Yeah. Dude. Uh, and yeah. It, he, what, what was um, mom doing to stop drinking more? Up? Just drinking. <laughs> just drink more until you black it out, you know? That was her way of dealing with it because she met a guy who could finally financially take care of her and didn't hit her. So she just tried to blank out the rest of it. So it's um, like, you know, <clears throat> as long as I'm not hurt, you know, it, it's good. He can do whatever, you know? Yeah. You know, she told me when we moved in to actually this house uh, in 1992, um, I got in trouble at school in one of the fights. This girl, this girl named Kate came up behind me and she was wearing cowboy boots and she kicked me right in the balls, man, just like as hard as she could. And it dropped me to the ground and I was crying and she was standing there laughing. And I got up and I punched her in the face. I was pissed. And, you know, fourth grade, third grade, something like that. I think I was a second grade then. Um, and yeah, when I got home that day, he he fucking lost it, man. He he lost it. He was not about hitting girls. And so he took me out in the garage. And my mom, I remember my mom told me, she was like, if he leaves a mark on you, I'm leaving him. And he took me out in the garage and he took a sledgehammer handle, like, you know, big old thick piece of wood. Oh, and yeah. just beat the shit out of me with that thing until I was like black and blue and bloody and, and just fucked up. And I came in and I was crying to her. And I'll never forget the look on her face, man, because like seeing her ha have that like moment, you know, of disconnect in her eyes where she's like, I know I said I would do this, but I can't bring myself to do it kind of. And that's when she started drinking real heavy, you know, like after that point. So it was, um, yeah, I had, a, I had a lot of that shit I had to deal with whenever I came home. And, you know, I never the, the weird part was to me, like as I grew older, teachers would always ask me they're like you know is is anything going on at home and i was always like no no nothing's going on like what no nah, everything's fine and it wasn't because i was lying about it it's because i just literally didn't understand that that wasn't normal you know it wasn't normal to have your parents treat you that way mm -hmm. i had no idea like it's just how i was brought up like every adult i'd known up to that point just like beaten cursed and you know, we're, we're terrible people, it seemed like. So, yeah, yeah I I don't know. And it wasn't then, until I... No, oh, go, go ahead. ahead and finish. No, go ahead and finish. No, no, it, was, it wasn't until I was older that, that it finally started dawning on me, you know, that I kind of had to start relearning everything about life, like all my preconceived notions, all that stuff that you sort of inherently pick up as you're going along. Like, I had to question all of it, 
you know, is any of this a good idea? Is this any of this a good way to be living? You know, it made me stop drinking. Eventually I was like 23 when I quit drinking because I realized I was going down that same path, like where I was just getting trashed and, and making bad choices and being awful to my friends and to my wife and, you know, not taking care of my, my finances. And yeah, I, I was just like, wait a minute. I woke up one day after I'd made out with my buddy's girlfriend he didn't know about it. I still don't think he knows, but I made out with his girlfriend and uh, had cussed out my wife that night because I was married. And I, yeah, I woke up the next day. I'm like, what the fuck was I doing? Like, that ain't me. That I'm not the person who does that. I never cheated on anybody in my life. I would never do that. Like, what am I doing? So like after that moment, I, I just quit. I was like, dude, I can't, I clearly cannot control myself when I drink. So I'm done. Okay. And um, during that time, where was dad? So my dad was up in Alaska. I didn't see him again until I was eight. Okay. Um, he he lived in Washington for a while. I was down in Oregon here. Um, like I said, we moved in with my grandma. We moved out. We got a townhouse together. While we were living, in, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit here. But no, back good. to prior to my stepdad coming in, um, my mom and I did move out of my, my grandma and grandpa's house. We moved into a townhouse in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, we were doing oddball, weird jobs. We were doing, um, God, like window painting. We would go clean bars and stuff. Oh, like wow. I'd go help her clean bars on Sunday mornings after the, the Saturday night rushes and yeah, just doing like whatever we could to make money. You know, like I remember standing out there like painting pumpkins on windows and snowmen and stuff, you know, for the shops downtown. I mean, seem seemed pretty fun, right? Seemed pretty fun at yeah. the time. It did. It did. All right. But we were so poor, man. We were so poor. At one point, we were splitting a box of macaroni between us a day. Like, we would take, she would make a box of macaroni in the morning and then cut it in half. And then we would each have a quarter, you know, like split the half and then split the half for breakfast and dinner. And that was all the food we had for like months at one point. Um, yeah it was it was hard times you know we had a little three inch black and white tv in the the living room on a on an end table with a uhf antenna and a little dial on it so you could get like three channels i remember those i remember yeah those. you remember those little portal ones yeah. the handle yeah dude My yeah that's what we had in our living room Damn. dude <laughs> does that make me your dad no <laughs> oh, okay okay <laughs> all right so um Man, that that's a lot, and it's like eight years old. You're eight, second grade. That's like, how do you think you was mentally at that time? Like, your your whole thought process. Dude, I was so disconnected from everything by that point. You know, like I remember later on going to my psychologist, or yeah, my psychologist. I was going to say therapist, and I smashed him. But my psychologist, he um. He asked me that about that. He's like, how did it make you feel watching your dad do that to your mom? And I was like, I don't, I didn't feel anything. You know, I don't remember feeling anything. He's like, don't you think that's weird? And I was like, no. <laughs> He's like, don't you think that's weird? Like maybe actually now that you say it, like maybe that is a little weird that I don't feel anything about that, man. Like, cause I have, I've always been totally emotionally disconnected. And that was one of the things that made me such a good soldier. You know, was I was really good at, at being the guy who was like, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to work harder than anybody. I'm going to get up before everybody. I'm going to run farther than anybody. I'm going to like go to bed later than everybody. I'm going to do more than everybody. I'm going to take that extra mission. Like I was the most gung ho dude. And when you're in the military, dude, they use you. They're like, cool. Like that guy. Let's 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 use that guy till he's just drained. Exactly. Um, and I've realized, man, that was my problem it was like, and that's what made me get out of the military. Finally, was I was like, dude, this this environment is built for somebody who's got severe issues in real life. You know, like this, this is an environment built to sustain a certain mindset that is totally unhealthy for me as a person right now. And I got to get out like I need to. I need to spend a little bit of time figuring out who I am and what I am about and like getting in touch with my emotions and my feelings and, you know, like reconnecting mentally with, you know, that other part of me because I wasn't a complete person. You know, I was always depressed. I was depressed from the time I was like 12 years old on, you know, I, I couldn't sleep at night and I never really understood why. 
<clears throat> I just kept pushing okay. till I cracked. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's let's see. We're we're at second grade, you're eight years old. Um, to say that your dad doesn't know anything, you know, because he's in Alaska, right? Yeah, yeah, and he didn't know about any of the stuff going on here. Okay, so I think let's move ahead. Third grade, anything significant in the third grade that happened? Nah, nah, I got some fights, man. I I did a bunch of, I was a big reader. I was a huge reader, especially from second, third, fourth, fifth grade. I was always reading books. Okay. That was my main thing. So I, I was... Think... No, no, go ahead. Okay. So I'm thinking it's fourth grade when we um, went to homeschooling. Mm -hmm. That's that's when we went to homeschooling. Um, what was the big reason for going to homeschool right then and there? And was the mom, stepdad still in the house and everything? Yeah, they were. They were. And <clears throat> um, yeah, I got, I got in a fight. It was like my third fight of the year. And it was maybe October or November or something like that. So only a couple months into the school year. Mm -hmm. And this kid, I remember the fight, like the kid, I was go about to go down the slide and this kid ran up behind me and smacked me on the back of the head and uh, jetted down the slide and was like, ha 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 ha, you know, after me like that. And I just was so pissed because I told people many times, like, I don't like getting hit in the back of the head. So this kid did it specifically because he knew that I didn't like it. And I, I ran after him and I yanked his arm behind his back hard enough to make him squeal and started just punching him in the head. And um, that was that was it for the teachers. They're like, we're tired of dealing with this kid. Like, he's he's out of here. You know, I don't, I don't know how it went down. I was in fourth grade, but yeah. I know that after that, I went to homeschool and and that situation. It, it was pretty good, man. It was pretty good because I finally got to, like, learn at my own pace, you know. And that was a big thing in school. It was like, I tried to bring Moby Dick to school in fourth grade. And the teacher's like, you don't understand that. And I'm like, yes, I do. And she told me, she's like, well, I want you to read one page of it to me. And if you mess up more than three words, you can't read it. And so I read the whole page to her flawlessly. And then she told me I couldn't read it anyway. And I was a smart ass. Oh. So, yeah, it was just teachers like that, man. I, <laughs> I, I was much happier homeschooling. Yeah, that teachers like that is like why most of our kids are dumb, you know. Yeah, like well, what's the problem, you know? Like, like no problem. I don't know. But um, you know, it seemed like the kids weren't afraid of you, you know, knowing that you were always getting into a fight. Nobody was afraid of you, or nobody's afraid of me, man. I've I've always been like a goofy dude. Nobody ever takes me seriously. Cause my, my like fighting words come out just like this, you know, like when I'm angry, I still sound like this and people don't like seem to recognize when I'm serious. But like, if I say I'm going to punch you in the face, that means I'm going to punch you in the face. Like that doesn't mean that I'm pretending or I'm joking. Like I'm telling you what I'm going to do so that you know, ahead of time, if you take the action that I asked you not to, that I will do this action, you know, like it's straightforward, man. Mm -hmm. So and it's like I, I've always been like straightforward like that. Yeah, and um, with that being said, it's like the teachers didn't, like, hey, you know, what did these kids do to have this kid beat their ass, you know? I, I don't remember them ever asking. I don't think they ever care. You know, because after you get in one or two fights, everybody starts looking at you like you're the problem, you know? You, you have that happen one time. Every teacher in the school knows your name, and they know you as that kid who gets in fights. So they all start treating you like crap and looking at you like you're crap. And that's what happened all the way through middle school, too, man. Like, I remember seventh grade in, in sixth grade, I got moved up to eighth grade math and they put me in eighth grade math. And the teacher would literally sit on the desk of like one of the popular girls at the front and make fun of me for my name and all that stuff. You know, because I got Dana. It's a girl's name. And they would sit up there and make fun of me for how I dressed and, and for how I talked and like the teachers, dude, some of those teachers were just shit. They were just shit. Yeah. That's, that's a fucking teacher for you. Like dude, I, I probably would have hit the teacher. I, I, I thought, 
<laughs> well, the second grade teacher I felt bad about, man, because that was the one I punched. And that was that was not at all her fault. So we were in those little four quad groups, you know, where they put like four students desks together. Okay. The second grade. We're in one of those. And she's like, all right, we're going to go to the library now. Everybody pick a, a writer from your group, somebody to take notes. And I was like, please, guys, you know, I don't like taking notes. Can um, can somebody else do it? And all three of them looked at each other and were like, he's taking notes. Ha! And I was just so mad at that. Like, I, I, I don't know. That stuff would just trigger me when people would just be assholes for no reason. It would really piss me off in a way that now think it back on it was like really unnatural how much that would make me mad um but they all everybody stood up to go to the the uh library and lined up to go to the library and i was just sitting there i was just fuming i was shaking i was mad and i'm like ah like just control yourself and the teacher came up behind me she's like dana come on dana and she put her hand on my shoulder and I just, boom just clocked her right in the face and she grabbed me and threw me out in the hall. And she's like, go to the principal's office and slammed the door. I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to the principal's office. And I just ran home. <laughs> and then they had the cops out looking for me because, you know, a, a seven year old just left the school and ran down the street. So, yeah, I did. I know it's like not very linear here with my storytelling, but God, I just I keep remembering more experiences, you know? Uh huh. I mean. Would you say that was the good? Oh, you're teacher? cutting out for me, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, Not sure shit. if it's just Discord or. Could be Discord. Give me a second. Let me check this. Okay, out. I ha I hear you a little bit better now. Okay. All right, everybody out there, hear me. You guys good? We're gonna aim for yes. Okay, we're, we're gonna go for yes. <laughs> so, um, they can't hear it now. They'll hear it on YouTube. True, true. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, would, was that one of your good teachers that you punched in the face? She probably was, man. I don't remember anything else about that teacher. <laughs> I really don't. Like she, that is just that one instance. I remember the classroom. I remember we went and did a uh, like outside thing with butterflies at one point. But other than that, I don't remember anything else about that teacher. The other teacher, though, the eighth grade one, I know it. Now, here I am jumping from second to eighth grade again. But <laughs> but uh, that eighth grade teacher, she was awful, man, because that was what I was trying to tell you here was I later on as an adult after I joined the military, had my son, you know, like became an adult. Um, I ran into that teacher at a movie store and I walked in and I saw her standing at the counter and I thought to myself, I'm like, man, it's that bitch from from elementary or from middle school. And I'm like, dude, you know, you're a grown man now. You you like you're responsible. You're respectable now. Like you're above that, you know, like maybe you just misunderstood. Like maybe she wasn't so bad. Maybe maybe she like just maybe she you know, like maybe your young mind was overplaying how bad she was. Uh <laughs> And then she sees me and she looks at me and the first words out of her mouth are, Hey, look who never went anywhere in their life. <laughs> and I'm like this bit, like what? Like I'm 21 right now. I'm in the military. I actually, I think I owned my house at that point. I owned a home. And, and she says that to me right off the bat. And so the first thing I do is I look at her and I, I say, I'm like, Oh, look who's 16 year old daughter got pregnant. <laughs> her daughter got knocked up just like a year before and i'd heard about it so yeah mm. just hit her right back with it and she stormed off you know all huffed up and i'm like you know what she was a bitch fuck her <laughs> like what the I, I don't know man thank thankfully i never had that many experiences with teachers like you had but fuck <laughs> I don't know what my luck is, man. I had a bad run. I did have one good teacher, though. Ninth grade, man. There was this guy, Mr. Hammer, and he was an Oxford-educated PhD, somebody who totally didn't belong at this school. Like, everybody else got their four-year, you know, bachelor's degree in education. This dude's like an Oxford professor who just decided to go on a hippie whim to a tiny town and teach at an unknown school for once and and bring joy to that school district you know like 
like like the like if uh, if Einstein came and taught at your local high school, you know, like that was his dream. He's like, I want to bring that level of education and knowledge to these kids who don't get it. And man, after one year at that school, I remember seeing him on his way out the door. He's like, fuck this school, man. They got the worst <laughs> staff here. They got the worst teachers. I'm out, man. I ain't never coming back here. I'm sorry. <laughs> like this guy. But yeah, he, he was a great teacher, dude. He was an absolutely fantastic teacher. Oh, man. Woo. So <laughs> where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Where we at here? We're, we're, we're in high school. Things, things are going okay, sort of. Relatively. All right. You know, yeah. like, you know, during your high school, like, how was your high school? What was your mind? Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Let's, let's jump back to the fight. Let's jump back to the fight where the kid tried to kill you. Like, Oh, okay. When you picked the bad friends. Tell us about the bad friends you were picking back then. Well, dude, like, so I, like I said, I'd just gotten done doing homeschooling and I hadn't had any friends that whole time. Like I just, you know, you don't have any opportunity to really meet anybody other than the, like the, the farm homeschooled kids who go to like the spelling bees out in the country that nobody knows exist, but happen for homeschooled kids. Um, yeah. Other than those kids, I didn't have any opportunities to make friends. So when I started going to school, uh, that's how I ran in this kid. His name was David, different David than the one I know now. Uh, and he would just always be walking to school at the same time I was. So like, we would end up, you know, just like walking together every day and we're like, screw it. Might as well like literally meet up to walk together, you know, and just met up every morning at six 30 or whatever. And, um, yeah, yeah. He kind of became my, my best friend at that point. And I didn't have any other friends, you know, uh, a couple months later, I made a couple more friends like David. I, I mean, I met David around that time. Um, uh, yeah, but I made friends with like three or four people outside this kid, and then that kid did all that crazy stuff, and and I ended up hanging out with them more. But it's been that same like core group of four people for like twenty years for me, because like those friends that I made in sixth grade are pretty much the same friends I have today, minus a few who have dropped off and aren't friends anymore. Okay, I mean it's good to have that core and stuff like that. So when the kid was like killing snakes and hanging their heads on nails and stuff like that like and you're watching him do it like where was your mindset at where's you still in that like mindset Dude, no i was so grossed out like the thought of even touching a snake grossed me out at the time and that was like i know i know that it sounds like a weak defense but that's like literally the truth of it man like i was just grossed out by snakes I really was. And so like the thought of like even picking one up, it's all slimy and squirrely. I mean, they're not slimy, but in my head, they were slimy. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, I don't, I'm not touching snakes, but I would just kind of like hang out with him while he did it and like sit and talk and like read a book, you know, or, like do something else just <laughs> to have company. What would so... you guys talk about? Oh, dude, I don't know. I, I began to realize something was wrong with him, though, one day when he said he came to me after school and he said his girlfriend broke her thumb uh, oh yeah i can't believe i haven't told this story on stream ever um his girlfriend told me or he came to me and told me that his girlfriend broke her thumb and he wanted he handed me a hammer and put his hand on a tree stump and said hey break my thumb and i was like dude i ain't breaking your thumb and he was he was getting like pissed he's like Fucking break it man break it do it do it you know like getting amped about it and I wouldn't do it. And finally he takes the hammer from me and just starts smashing his own hand with this hammer. And I'm like, Oh, uh, like I, I just want to go home. You know, like I, he made me uncomfortable, but I just, I, I didn't know any other feeling, you know, I didn't know like literally how else friendships are supposed to feel Didn't have any other friends. So again, it was just one of those situations where I was like, huh, I guess it's normal to have your friends demand you smash their hands with hammers. Mm -hmm. I guess that's how it is. All right. <laughs> you know, I don't like that, but that's cool. Um, yeah. Wow. Kid that, was nuts. That's yeah. That's, that's freaking nuts. So, yeah. um, we're good. We're, we're, we're coasting right now. Coasting through high school. You have your same four friends, you know, Probably picking up a friend yeah. or two, friend of a friend. 
And then uh, yeah, I definitely met some more people. Then boom, you're you're married, about to have a child. You join the military, all right? Well, I dropped out. I dropped out of high school in tenth grade. Okay. Um, I got I got my GED, and yeah, because I just I was skipping so much school that it just didn't make sense to keep even pretending to be in school. So yeah, I dropped out, got my GED. I ended up pretty much moving out of my parents' house when I was about 16. Um, just cause I couldn't, I couldn't stand living here anymore. Like it was, it was so abusive. Like anytime my stepdad was home, it was, it was going to be something, you know, it's either going to be a fight or it's going to be him calling me names or it's going to be something. Cause like he was always calling me names. Like, yeah, he, he was just not a good person. He was racist. Like, I don't know. I think he's a lot better person now, but I don't think he's a very good parent. You know what I mean? Like, he's yeah. not a bad person. He's just a terrible parent. Um, yeah, so I pretty much moved out and I was living on friends' couches. And I, I remember this one night, actually, it was with David again. Um, we were walking back to his house and... You know, none of my friends had said anything about me staying at their their houses like every night. But this one day he was like, hey, man, why don't you ever go home? And I was like, you know what, dude, it's it's cool, man. Like, I'll just I'll just go home tonight. You're right. You know, I don't want to be a bother. And he's like, no, I was I was just asking, you know, like, why don't you ever go home? You know, it wasn't like you can't stay. I was like, no, no, it's fine. I ended up just like sleeping on the, the bench in front of our house for the night. Like, I, I wouldn't even go inside. Um yeah, I just didn't want to deal with it. You know, I, <laughs> I learned a lot about who I didn't want to be in this world from, from my, uh, my parents, from all of them really. But I, you know, I learned good things too, in case my, my dad or my mom or anybody li listens to this, like, obviously I did learn some good things, but, uh, you know, they know what happened and they were there. So yeah, maybe. can't really talk shit about me saying the truth <laughs> not at all that's, that's why it's called the truth right yeah <clears throat> all right so let's let's get into the um, the military you join the military all right so like because i know like usually a lot of people who join the military they go in they get boot camp they come out you know we feel different all right. So when we go in the military, we feel different than civilians. Like, yeah. how was your thought process uh, with civilians after your military, like after your boot camp? Like, how did how did you feel when you came out? Dude, you come back and I think that everybody has that exact same feeling of of how petty all the problems are that everybody faces. Like the number of things that people fucking complain about, man are just minuscule i mean they're, they're massive but the problems are minuscule you know like you don't you don't know tire like when somebody's like man i didn't get very much sleep last night i only slept like like five and a half hours and i'm pretty tired it's like dude i have slept two hours a night for six months straight okay <laughs> don't even talk to me about and you don't hear me complaining a bit you know like what are you talking about? Like little problems like that. People complain about traffic and people complain about TV and they complain about shopping and they complain about like all these other things. And granted, you know, after, after a couple months of being a civilian again, or being back in the civilian world, you get back into it too, where you're like, man, why doesn't Karen hurry up up there? Beep, beep. You know, like you want to, you want to get things going too. But yeah, for a while there, you just have this like sense of Zen where, where you're just looking at everything like, nah, it's, it's cool. You know, it's fine. It's not a big deal. It's all right. We got this. We can fix this. It's not a big problem. Exactly. You know? And it's like, uh, um, do you have that feeling too when you came out? Yeah. When I came out, I, I'm looking at everybody. And I was like, like for me, it was more of like, I'm looking at people and like, well, you're, you're a fucking slob. Like, like, oh, you're, you're bitching about that. What? Right. Like, get your ass up. Like, Go wash the dishes yourself. All oh, my dishwasher's broken. What? Motherfucker. You got two hands, man. <laughs> what you mean your dishwasher's broken? You got legs? Yeah. Like it's just yeah. it's just different. And it's like you gotta learn to control that too. You and do. I, and it's like You do. 
you can't go I, to your friends and be like, hey, bruh, you know, I think you should shut the fuck up right now. You know, cause right. you're talking listen, about bro, you need to shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know what you mean, dude. I do. Um, I, I wrote a little story on a YouTube video a couple months ago that ended up getting like uh, like a ton of likes, like five or six hundred likes, which I totally didn't expect. I just I I wrote a story about something that happened to me and it was while I was in the military. Um, I had this one day where I had to come in at like 4 a.m. You know, normally we start at like six or seven, sometimes eight, you know, for National Guard or uh -huh. full time guard anyway. But that day we had to be in at four. We we're doing like inventory or something, you know, a bunch of dirty workout and maintenance shops. I'm sure you've done plenty of it. Um, yeah, so we're out there working on this stuff all day. It's like 11, 1130. And our staff sergeant's like, all right, you go to lunch. You got a half hour. And I'm like, dude, he, we get an hour lunch break every day. And I've got a half hour to go get food somewhere, which isn't here, and eat it and get back here. And it's lunch hour, man. Like, everything's going to have, every fast food place going to have lines. You know, so I, I rush to my car. I get in my car, rush over to McDonald's. It's the closest place. I pull in behind this minivan. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the clock. I'm like, it's been like eight minutes. Okay. I've got 22 minutes to eat. Like, okay. And I'm waiting. And dude, as I'm waiting, I'm getting like more and more upset. Like 30 seconds turned into 50 seconds and like 50 seconds turned into like a minute and a half. And I'm sitting here behind this van. I'm like, dude, what the fuck are they doing? Like, come on, order your food. Let's go. And I see her looking at me in her, her passenger mirror, you know, her, her driver's side mirror. Uh -huh. I can see her looking at me. She keeps looking back at me. And I'm like, dude, is this one of those fucking anti-military people? Like, is this one? Uh, is she up here just fucking with me? Like, what is going on? Like, order your food. And I'm getting more and more pissed off. And I'm yelling in my car. I got my windows up. And I'm, I'm getting pissed. And I'm starting to scream in my car. Like, let's fucking go let's go I, i'm like i i can't even back out now i got cars behind me i've got 13 minutes left to eat my food like let's go let's let's move and so she goes up finally finally pulls forward i go up to the the thing i order real quick i'm super pissed off i'm short with the lady on the other end squeal my tires you know jump up to the next spot in line slam on my brakes angry angry dana <laughs> And I, the lady gets her food out of the window. She pulls out, leaves. I go up to the next window and the lady reaches out and hands me a card. And I'm like super confused. You know, it's a gift card. And so I take it and she gives me this gift card. And I'm like, and, and then she hands me my food. And she's like, hey, the lady in front of you, her husband just died in Iraq. And she felt terrible and, and saw you were in your uniform and wanted to do something to thank you for your service. And dude, like I have never felt like a more self-centered piece of shit in my life. Like, what was I thinking? You know, like thinking that the world revolved around me in such a way, you know, I'm sitting there all pissed off about what's going on in my world and, and how I got to get back to work. And, and, you know, you have this very selfish, mindset that comes with with being a soldier and you know that ties into the the sense of discipline and duty you know they you feel like people should be moving with a sense of purpose you know and getting through the drive through like let's go you know and when you don't get that you begin to judge other people on on you know their own actions and sometimes you just really don't realize what's really going on exactly and that was one of those li moments in life where i sort of learned a bit of humility you know that that hit me with with hit me hard man it hit me hard because it reshaped you know thinking about her the fact her husband just died while i was just sitting there screaming at her you know this guy fucking literally died <laughs> so that i could eat that goddamn cheeseburger yeah and i'm yelling at his wife like dude <laughs> i uh man i feel like a piece of shit even telling the story still to this day but you know it's it's one of those ones that like I hope it helps somebody out there like take a second out of their own freaking day to when you're next time you're mad at somebody else, you're stuck in traffic or something like that. Like at least take a moment and, and think about it, man. Exactly. Cause that's where, um, that's where the word control, like, you know, when I say we got to control it, you know, cause we don't know like how we're taught, how you're branded in the military. We're branded differently. 
So it's like always in a rush, always in a move, always on the go, always got to be perfect, always got to do this, always got to do that. Never, Mm -hmm. never thinking about the bad stuff. It's like always moving and pushing and going and doing it as best as you can and stuff. So truthfully, like if you're if you're not too careful with it, the military is really teaching you to be selfish for you guys out there listening right now. That's that's basically does do that. That's basically what it's doing. And um, I have a couple of people in chat. Um, one of them is my one of my best friends, little brother. Mm. He's um, he's in the Marine Corps, I believe. I believe the Marine Corps. Hoorah! So he he's out there, you know. He has a family, so like you know. Navy. Navy. There we go. <laughs> That's the Navy one. It's <laughs> There we go. I, I knew it was one of them. Man. I knew it was one of them. <laughs> but it's like. We know. always make that joke. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, you know, like, this is this is why I do stuff like this, you know. I already knew Lemon Pops was in the military. Like, you know, I wanted to get some of this stuff out, too. So, you know, and I have another friend out there. Um, his name's like Itura. Funny thing mm-hmm. is, um, he's from Oregon. Um, I met him, like, been my best friend ever since we actually started talking. Met him in the Marine Corps. So it's like, awesome, uh, man. You know, like, I, I have people, and it's like, if they came to me, if they needed some advice or something, I got them, because I've been there before, you know, why not expose Lemon, because you've been there before, too, and, like, you you know a couple of things, I know a couple of things, but we don't yeah. know everything. And nobody know everything, man. And nobody. That's why we have each other, right? All right. All right, so. Small world, dude. We gotta all work together. Exactly. So um let's let's move on. Like um so at this point this is where um around the time you started drinking more? Is this around the time? Or... Well, so yeah, after after I got out of the or after I got out of high school, I went and joined the military. Um I got married around that time. Uh, about a year later I started going through a divorce. Um yeah, that was not a happy circumstance, which unfortunately I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on. But uh, yeah, just because my son watches the stream and I'm not about to spill all that. But um, yeah, it was it was a rough time, man. It was a, it was a really rough time going through that divorce. And through that, though, I did end up meeting another girl. I got my divorce. I got remarried. Um, that was about when I was 23. I bought a house, moved, moved. I was moving forward in life at that point because I ended up homeless. That was one thing that happened. Um, about a year after I got back from basic training, uh, I got evicted from my apartment. And so I had literally nowhere to go. Um, well, I could have gone to my mom's, but I wasn't speaking to her. I didn't talk to my mom or my stepdad for probably eight years, eight or ten years. Um just pretty much cut him out of my life, you know, because I remember at one point, <laughs> I remember at one point waiting to see how long it would take my mom to actually call me. And it was 14 months, took her 14 months to actually call me. And when she did call, she wanted money. She wanted to borrow money. And it was like, that was the only time I'd heard from her in over a year. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I, you know, you, you learn at a certain point that family, like she's family. She'll always be my family, you know, but who you associate with is going to determine who you are. And that was not any group of people I wanted to be associated with. You know, that wasn't what I wanted shaping my mentality at the time. Um, yeah, but I, I ended up homeless. I, I had just gotten a job at the national guard working full time. Um, well, it was before I started working for the guard guard. This was as a like mechanic as a contractor, a third party contractor mechanic. Okay type weird thing so i was doing i was doing humvee maintenance and five ton maintenance and that kind of stuff um and that was cool but it was right when i lost my apartment and i wasn't able to keep it so i was sleeping in my car working at the mechanic and dude let me tell you those are some lonely times if you've never been homeless that is the most boring 
time you will ever have in life because I would get off work at five and I'd go get in my car and it's like, all right, where do I go? It's like nowhere, man. <laughs> like this is it. Yeah. And you would sit there till you fell asleep and you would wake back up in the morning and you'd walk back in and it's like, that's your life. You would just go out to your car after work and wait. <laughs> Yeah, and dude it was so boring so boring the phones weren't good back then yet it was yeah close. i could make <laughs> some calls you know i could do some little crappy text messaging and like play snake but <laughs> luckily after about three months they realized that i was sleeping in the parking lot and they let me start staying in the armory oh. so i would just sleep in the maintenance bay next to the trucks and and that was pretty cool man it was kind of cool, like living in a maintenance shop, like an auto mechanic shop, like in it. Oh, still managed to be late to work one day, though. That oh, sucked. Nice. God, can you imagine being late to work when you live at work? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a little brutal. Kick the lights on. They're like, oh, you're sleeping. All right. Yeah. Well, you're not now. We're doing we're doing mechanic work. It's time to work. Oh, you're late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're late and you're. You clock home. in already. Just yeah. What'd up. you do in the Marines? Who me? Yeah, I was an admin. Admin. Nice, yeah. nice. That's what I, I ended up doing later on. Um, yeah, I can't tell the full story on record. Um, I'll you're let you. An admin. Yeah. I, I finished as an admin, but I'll I'll give you details later. But um, mm, okay, as far I was an admin, admin. Okay, gotcha. From start to finish, right. admin. <laughs> For the record, on camera, I was an administrative assistant. Okay, yes. and that's what I'm telling you legally. Legally. All right. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah, uh, I had my top secret SCI, but I never did anything cool with it. I mean, they, they got it for me. It was like a year-long process. You had to go through the polygraph. You know, you had to meet with the FBI a bunch of times. Dude, these guys went back and talked to my second-grade teacher. I, I kid you not. I got a call from my second-grade teacher. Not even the – no, 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 no. It was my first-grade teacher It was because it was at the old school in Corvallis. So it wasn't even from the local school. I'm thinking they got in touch like the, first grade. The teacher you punched in the face, they called her? <laughs> Dude, I hope not. Now that you mentioned that, man, because if they went to my first grade teacher, I didn't list her on anything. Like, they just started tracking people down. I started getting calls from people I hadn't talked to in 10 years going like, hey, this FBI agent just showed up at my house asking about you. Yeah, like, eh, weird, you know? <laughs> like, dude, it was so crazy. But after all that, I didn't do anything with it. Like, yeah, I got access to some classified information, which for anybody who doesn't know, most classified information is just fucking boring. It's just really boring. It's just, it is sensitive, but it's boring, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, to let you know, I didn't do nothing with mine. Like, it was like, hey, you want to get your top secret? Nope. No. No. <laughs> it's like i don't need to know no. none of that no mm -mm. right uh, it's like if i know any secret that can get me killed no nah <laughs> <laughs> done <laughs> yeah, yeah dude they told my my nco was just like well we'll put you in for a tssci and if you don't get it they'll just drop it to the next lower one so we'll just aim for the top which that was right before edward snowden and all that so once the edward snowden thing went through they started doing all sorts of checks on how many people they'd given. And that's when I found out they never should have given me a TSSCI. Like, per their own regulations, somebody in my position had no business having a TSSCI. Yeah. I was just doing admin. So, like, yeah, you would get, like, battlefield pictures and, and troop movements and stuff like that. But you didn't need TSSCI for that. You didn't need I, TS for that, hardly. I think um, in my – because um, I was with a Victor unit. Um, and our, um, well, for those who don't know what Victor unit is, that's, um, like an infantry unit basically, basically for the Marine Corps Victor units. So when I was in my Victor unit, like, um, I think my staff sergeant or my gunny sergeant had it and my Lieutenant had it because they needed it. But like people in our positions, like we didn't need it like unless we were writing reports and it was like hey mm. golden do you want to go in 
Nah, not really. So, we went on deployment, and, you know, like, I kind of never knew this. Like, um, since I didn't take that, I had to be in the guard force for the whole deployment. Mm. So, basically, Marine Corps, everybody's uh, infantrymen. Everybody. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Your first job is infantrymen, so you got to know what to do out there and stuff like that. And then your job is... Same in the Army. Yeah. Then your job is second. So... I'm out there in guard force, and I was like, I was promised to go back to my shop, but I really can't go to my shop because there's information that I cannot learn because of the class I had. Because mm. mm. um, we were basically, we were the admin shop for the whole battalion, mm -hmm. which is um, everybody, basically. So the people we report to is the three top guys, Sergeant Major, um, Lieutenant Colonel, and then the Colonel. Those gotcha. Like, like besides my gunnery sergeant and my lieutenant, mm -hmm. Those are the only guys that we really have to answer to. Like, as far as the our company CO, we really don't have to answer to them, but we do, you know, because rank system. Right. So yeah, commander tells you to do something. Usually, yes, usually got to do it. But and it, then you take it to the battalion commander and be like, "Hey, sir, he's telling me to do this." You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like, really? We wouldn't even have to do that. we just go to the sergeant major and the sergeant major be like, oh, no, the fuck, you're not. <laughs> right? Dude, I know what that's like. I was on battalion Man. staff, and I know exactly what that like, you know? <laughs> like, uh, actually, the, the command sergeant major wanted me to do something, so sorry. I'm not doing that. <laughs> it was like, um, the funny thing is, like, um, my first sergeant told me, the first sergeants were telling me to do something, and, um, I went and told my staff, my gunny sergeant, and uh, we were talking about it back and forth. And he's like, Golden, you need to be tactful about this. And Sergeant Major just walks up and like he's in the lieutenant's office just overhearing this conversation. And I was like, OK, so I'm going to do this for Sergeant Major real quick. And then I'm going to go down and take my ass chewings because that's basically all it was, was me getting my ass chewed downstairs. And it's mm. not just one ass chewing. I go to weapons company. You got to go through the chain of ass chewing. <laughs> I was like, I go to weapons company, um, first sergeant, then India company, first sergeant, then my H&S, first sergeant, then Kilo, and then Juliet. And then I'm just, it's going to be, it's going to be a good day for me because it's going to be mm. five ass chewings in a row. <laughs> On how they fucked up. Oh, man. Up. <laughs> so. God. And that's how it goes, too. How they fucked up. You know? And it's like, so. We went through that. <laughs> I was going downstairs and um, Sergeant Major was like, hey, Golden. I was like, hey, Sergeant Major. He was like, where are you going? I was like, oh, I'm going to talk to the first sergeant right now. He's like, cool. I'll come <laughs> with you. I was like, uh yeah you, you can't tell him no like he's basically right yeah no that's like um yeah he's like top three in my battalion right now so it's like oh i, I can't tell you no so then we go downstairs and um first sergeant i walk in i was like hey is first sergeant in he's like yeah he's in First Sergeant Golden's here. He's like, good. I've been ready to chew his ass all day. <laughs> Sergeant Major, how you doing today? <laughs> he was like, yeah, there ain't going to be no ass chewing today. Now go get your other friends and we back in here. So it's like, it's funny to see how the chain of command goes because it's just. Oh, dude, it's, it it's is. fucking hilarious. It's like the Three Stooges. It's like, as much as yeah. I'm scared of them. They're scared of another dude who's only one rank higher just as much. Yeah, and the authority that they exert is always impressive. Like, I know exactly what you mean. Like, when you have a high-ranking official standing next to you that everybody is subservient to around you, and then all of a sudden somebody else comes in and they're like, hey, why don't you go wait outside, okay? Okay, bud? All right. And then they just take over, you know? It's like, it's like when an alpha dog has like a dire wolf walk in and and the alpha wolf just just tail tucks and walks out of the room 
you know it's it's got that that aspect to it like i remember this one time our first sergeant smoked all of our drill sergeants in front of us because they screwed something up and man that was that was a perfect example of that you know because drill sergeants you never see them get lit up for anything and to see a first sergeant pull all the drill sergeants out and smoke them in front of the privates like dude that was something everybody everybody man like that that just be it's it's not funny to watch either because shit rolls downhill always yeah yeah oh yeah always rolls downhill so yeah you know, if you gotta them, <laughs> watching them getting their ass fucking tore up they're just next. looking at you the whole time just oh, like you're next <laughs> yeah uh-huh. yeah <laughs> There's a reason why we fucked up. It's your ass. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, man. All right. Oh. So we went off on the tangent there, guys. Sorry about we that. We did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, like, that's... It's 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 a mind. It's a mind thing. And, like, uh, when you meet up with other people who went through basically the same shit that you went through, no matter what you're doing... Army, Navy, Marine Corps, National Guard, any of them. Like, it's all around the same shit, just a different flavor. Yep. Different clothes, same job. Mm -hmm. Protect the nation, baby. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So you're sleeping. um, You're sleeping. uh, Hold on. Hold on. What's going on in chat? You got somebody you need to ban there? Man. Jacob deserve dit. I don't know who Jacob is. Oh, yeah, no, he's definitely somebody you need to ban. I see it now. <laughs> there it is. But yeah, anyway, um so after yeah, I was sleeping in my car. I was I was homeless. I ended up getting an apartment. Um, save enough, enough money to do that. And it was really weird for that period of time because I was living in not hotels too because it's like the only place I could shower, you know? Just go uh-huh. get a hotel room. Um, yeah, ended up finally getting an apartment, uh, breaking things off with my wife finally, and and I was, I was done with that whole situation. Um, ended up meeting my next wife. We got together, gathered a couple years, got a house. God, was I like 20, 21? Dude, it's all starting to run together after like 15 years. It is all starting to run together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But that was like, it was when I went through my second divorce that I really started to break down. I know that was what you mainly wanted to focus on here today was the, the mental health thing. And that was like the big turning point for me was after I went through the second divorce and and found out that she'd cheat on me. Um. I, I was done, man. Like after all the crap I'd been through in life, you know, from from two years old with my, and then my stepdad and then the first divorce and all the, the horrible stuff that went on in that situation. And then the, the second divorce and it also turning out south. Like I finally just came to this conclusion where I was like, I am worthless. Clearly, like clearly nothing I've done in my life has led me to be a person worth like having around, you know, and, and to, to come to that sudden realization that you're just like an absolute utter piece of shit. Um, finally like tipped me over the edge. And, and that's what happened was, uh, maybe three months after, after we split, uh, I was, I was finally going to actually kill myself. That was, that was going to be the point. Um, I was done, man. And like that's like that's it's hard. It's hard. It's it's very yeah. hard when you come to that conclusion, like, you know, and it's like nobody understands because like what you're showing on the outside and I'm pretty sure nobody's looking at you and they're being like, Hey, you know, this guy he's not alright. Something's wrong, you know, like what can we do to help? Because they don't see that. Like you don't get to see that most of the time. 
and that's most of, of the time yeah at, at, at this point in my life sorry to interrupt you just yeah, like ahead. but to be clear like by this by this point in my life like it was obvious to everybody i i was not doing well i'd lost like 50 55 pounds or something in, in two or three months um i wasn't eating i wasn't sleeping i was snorting everything i could get my nose on um i was doing drugs i was drinking i was i was doing everything i could to throw myself out a window pretty much uh like I was, um, dude, I would just chop up like four or five Ambien and snort them every night and, and just get blacked out. Cause I don't know if you've ever done Ambien man, but you fall asleep without actually falling asleep. It's the yeah. weirdest thing. And so I remember this one night I sort of came to, cause I had, I had left my, <laughs> and it was it was one of those things that like, I didn't realize what I'm saying until later, but I left my apartment with my loaded gun in my hand and went outside so that the cops could kill me. And I was wandering around the apartment complex with my gun for probably like 40 minutes before I finally realized what I was doing. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Like I'm doing what? Like, what am I doing out here? It's cold. It's December. You know, it wasn't December. It was probably like March, but it was still winter. And I'm, I'm wandering around out here with a freaking loaded gun in the middle of town, like trying to get shot by the cops. Like I was, I was, I was not in a good place, man. Um, and you're right. Like for a majority, the majority of my adult life, you know, I've been depressed and I've even been suicidal at other points, but never like this. This was like, like I describe it like this, man. Like if you've got normal mental healthy right here and then you say, okay, like depression starts down here it's it's a gentle but steep bluff that you go off and and normally like when most people i feel like when they say they're depressed they're like here they're at the edge of this cliff but there's the spot like when you get really depressed you're going to be like down here on this the slope you know and then it just plummets man there is like no bottom at all to that pit that you can fall off of like if you don't kill yourself and you do just keep living and continue to get worse mentally, it's an endless thing to to the point of insanity. And I was at a point where I was literally going insane. I got I got I, I mean literally, I got diagnosed with psychotic depression um shortly thereafter. And psychotic depression is something that causes me to hear and see and remember things that didn't happen. Um usually in a negative connotation. So I started realizing that a lot of my problems, a lot of the things, you know, a lot of the hate that I'd felt from a lot of people and a lot of things I'd hear, heard my friends say, like I would lay in my room and listen to David, my current roommate. I would lay in my room and listen to him talk about killing me and, and him and everybody joking about it and laughing about how, who's going to get my TV. And, and, you know, like, Hey, like, fuck this guy. He's such a loser. Do you think he's dead yet? You know, shit like that. And I finally realized, like, that's not true. None of that was actually happening. I was just being psychotic. And because, like, really, I mean, David and I have been friends for 20 years. Like, why the fuck would he do that? You know, like, it didn't occur to me to ask those questions. But, yeah, it turned out that a lot of the stuff, not a lot, but but at various points of, of severe depression, um, I do sort of have that psychotic break where I, I literally like crack mentally and start making shit up to make me hate myself more. Um, and that's been a major problem. Like, cause I ended up in the mental hospital for a day. It was just a day, but I, I did end up there. Um, and then after that, I started doing therapy because I realized like, man, I told him, I told him when I went in, I was like, look, dude you've got six weeks and I'm killing myself. I'm telling you that honestly, like you've got six weeks to make me not want to kill myself or I'm done because nothing people keep telling me it's going to get better. People have been telling me my whole fucking life. It's going to get better. Like, Oh, just give it a little time. You know, you'll, you'll meet somebody else. Yeah. I had met somebody else and they divorced me. Oh, it'll get better. You get, I ended up homeless again. It doesn't get better. It, nothing ever gets better. Like it just keeps fucking happening and I'm done. I'm done. Like whatever my draw in life is, I was done. I'm like, this is not worth being here for. Like nobody, I wouldn't wish this experience of an existence on anybody. This has just been a fucking terrible run. And I realize it's luck 
And I realize it's just bad luck and that things can change. But at that point in my life, I'm like, it doesn't matter if it changes because this sucks and this will have always sucked. And no amount of good that can come past this point in my life will ever have made what I've been through worth living. That's how I felt. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then, then uh, I got on antidepressants. Yeah. But yeah, sorry. And then it's like with that and like when you're in that mindset, like that's how you think the world works and that's how you think it works and how it's calculated. And then it's like, well, it's going to be me. And then this, hopefully this sorry asshole here dies too. And then it just comes like in a full circle, you know, because like when you kill yourself, like, you know, people be like, Hey, it's selfish, you know, but you yeah, know, like, you can't you can't look at it like this is going back to the talk where we're saying control. He's like you can't think about somebody killing themselves as selfish because you're only thinking about oh they've been through that for oh, you you know they they've been through that oh you know that's that's nothing you know their their parents hit them their whole life my mom my dad did this but there doesn't come a time to where it's like it doesn't matter two wrongs don't make a a right. Just because your parents yeah. did the same thing as that other person doesn't mean that it shouldn't have happened at all. Right. Yeah. And so many people do that. Like it's a comparison game. Like, oh, just because you handled it all right, everybody else should be able to. Like, maybe you didn't handle it so right all after all. You know, if you're if you're going around acting like other people should just suck it up, then maybe there's something fucking wrong with you because you clearly don't have a good sense of, of understanding of your own self. If you haven't real if you've you've clearly never felt pain man like you've never been broken you've yeah. never been tortured by somebody who love you loved like if you think that you you don't understand yeah. um and that's cool i don't hate i don't hate anybody for not understanding but but like you're right you know uh-huh and then it's like um and yes you, kwan <laughs> you you put it like this it's like um like we could we could look at you women and we'd be like you didn't have that moral support tree to help you out of these situations you know where this person who's like oh my parents beat me but you had the steps you had an auntie or a sister or somebody who came and took you out of that thing while this person is still laying in the poison you know mm -hmm. So it's like there's a lot of things to think about this and a lot of ways we should think about it. But this is this is where the awareness comes in. And, dude, that's why I, I always try to describe it as like a statistical thing nowadays. Like I, I'm an INTJ. I'm very analytical. I'm very uh, like system driven. Um, and, and that's been one of the ways that helped me cope with this the most was realizing that literally if we take all the possible things that can happen to a human being in a lifetime let's say there's a list of like a hundred billion you know you can stub your toe or not stub your toe you could be a child soldier or you cannot be a child soldier you can be a french prostitute you can not be a french prostitute there's a billion a hundred billion different things you could be in your life and there are eight billion people 20 total billion people who have ever lived or something like that um statistically if you take all the possible combinations of all the events that can happen to you in your life, and we assume that for some reason they're exactly half good and half bad, which I, I don't believe that to be the case, but I, I think that just for the purpose of this, this conversation, it works fine. If, if we assume half of them are good, half of them are bad, then statistically every single individual human's life who's born is going to have 50% good stuff and 50% bad stuff. But for every person that's born that has 100% good stuff, there's going to be somebody else born who has 100% bad stuff. It's a statistical thing. But the odds of rolling, you know, on a, a D6, the number 6, 35 times in a row, I, granted, yes, it's the same odds each time you throw the dice, but the odds of doing it that many times in a row are astronomical, you know? And at some point in your life, no matter how many times you've rolled that dice and got a 1, eventually you are going to get a six and you're going to hit win you know and mm -hmm. that's just the way life works it's just random chance all right it's and it's what you make of it it's your perception of how you perceive those events and that is in your control like that is something 
that has to be in your control because literally nothing else in this world outside of your skin sack is in your control sometimes. Yeah, so um, we're going to go back to the subject. Um, six weeks. That's what you told him, right? That is what I told him. Right. I did. And I was I was serious about that. I was like, look, so the night, the day that I was going to actually kill myself was um, I David had already taken my gun. Um, everybody had like taken everything sharp for me because I was cutting myself and, and doing all sorts of shit. You know, like, think about this, man. Like, a grown-ass man. I, I got a kid out there. I, I'm fucking 27 years old, and I'm cutting, like, a teenage girl in my bedroom. Like, that's how messed up I was mentally. Like, it just... I never understood cutting prior to that. And and I finally understood it. Um, but, yeah, leading up to that day, I hadn't slept in, like, three days. And I was just working myself up to actually doing it. And I'd actually tried to kill myself a couple weeks prior to that and failed. Um, I had snorted a bunch of Ambien. And the funny part is I didn't even find out about this till later. So this may be a story I should tell later. But what happened was I had apparently been doing Ambien and making like little video recordings on my webcam on my computer and not remembering doing them. So I found all these video files on my computer of me like high out of my mind blacked out like just clearly not there i didn't remember any of them like weird stuff like telling stories about tanks and birds and weird things to the camera and like making faces for hours at the camera like dude weird stuff on ambien but one of the videos i found on my computer like really really messed me up um because one of those nights when i was doing ambien i had apparently turned my camera on and pulled out my gun and I loaded it and I told everybody goodbye and I put it to my head and I pulled the trigger and you hear the gun go click and I'm sitting there like you watch me loaded on camera you know and the only thing that saved my life that night was that I was so fucked up that I'd forgotten to cock it I'd forgotten to actually chamber around and I thought I'd killed myself, you know, and watching myself do that and not remembering any of it, like, like it was somebody else. I'm like, do not, am I about to watch this guy kill himself? And I'm like, no, obviously not idiot. You're sitting here, but it's like, am I sitting here? Like that guy looks like he's going to kill himself. Like this is a dude killing himself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I dude, it messed me up. Um, but I didn't even find that video for months until months later. Uh, <laughs> I had already had my gun taken though by my roommate and I was laying in bed and I was watching him and I was just sitting there watching him and he hadn't left his room in like six or seven hours, like not to go to the bathroom, not to get food, not to do nothing. And I was to the point where I was just, I had tears streaming down my face and I was like, dude, just like, please fucking leave your room because he's got my gun in there and I'm waiting for him to go like anything bathroom, like go to the kitchen, fucking get somewhere where I can make a run for it. And I'm going for that gun and I'm fucking ending it. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that day I was done and he didn't leave his room for like seven hours. And I finally had this moment of clarity where I was like, I need to get the fuck out of this house. Like right now, like right now I need to get out of here. Cause if he leaves his room, I'm dead. I'm, I'm going to do it. And there's no doubt in my mind that that's going to happen. And so I went and I grabbed my keys and I said, look, dude, I'm taking myself to the hospital because I am not going to last another day. Um, and I went and drove myself to the VA and was like, look, I'm feeling super suicidal. You got a place that can keep me from killing myself for a while. <laughs> and so they put me in the, the inpatient area there for, for 24 hours just to hold me. I mean, so I was self-admitted, but... That was that was really the turning point. I, I after that, they got me in touch with the therapist and or psychologist. I'd never been to a psychologist before. I'd only been to like therapists and counselors and therapists and counselors, man. They're for like your girlfriend left you kind of shit. They're not for like your first memory is your dad bashing your mom's head into a sink. You know, they're like not there for the deep, hard 
solid issues they're there for like oh you're a little sad today you know uh -huh. and so going to an actual psychologist man was a totally different ball game like this guy knew his shit he was intelligent he was smart he was witty he understood where i was coming from and and we were actually able to connect for the first time i was ever never able to connect with somebody that got me started on uh antidepressant i don't remember which one and this is the third time in my life i tried antidepressants but this time man i was like look I'm going to give this guy six weeks. I'm going to give him everything he asked for. I'm, I'm going to take the, the, the fucking pills every day on time. I'm going to show up to every single psychologist appointment. I'm going to do every single thing that they asked me to do. And at the end of it, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> if, if I still feel like it, that's what I'm doing. And oddly enough, at the end of six weeks, I, I, I checked my calendar and it was the day. And I'm like, you know, today's not so bad. <laughs> Today ain't so bad. The meds had started working. And dude, let me tell you, medication changed my life. I didn't realize that I had never felt happiness before. Like that was that was the thing that got me most. When I started taking meds, I realized that prior to this time, I had always felt like, oh, you know, on a scale of one to ten, today I'm like a like a five, you know, today's kind of like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle, but you know, it could be better. It's not the worst. Uh, oh, today, today's like a three out of 10, you know, it's kind of a worse day. Oh my God. Today's a two out of 10. It's just an awful day. Or today's a seven out of 10. It's a great day. I realize this isn't a one to 10 scale that we live life on. It's a one to a hundred scale. And I was at like a 60 or a 70 or an 80. And I'm like, dude, I have never in my life felt this good. I feel like 10 times better and happier. Like things make me genuinely laugh now. I feel joy. I'm like, dude, these are all feelings I'd never really felt before in my life, man. And I mean that literally like nothing had ever made me feel good before. And so once I realized like what feeling good felt like and realizing that I'd never felt that. I realized that nobody who's ever grown up depressed is ever going to understand what they're missing. And that's okay. It's okay if you don't understand it, but trust somebody who's trying to help you because dude, there, there is plenty worth living for. And I promise you, man, like a lot of the problems that I hit, um, going throughout life came up as a result of me being depressed. They came up from my own insecurities and my own uh, fears, you know, I, I grew up being abused like that. And so I was always afraid, like every girl that I was ever with cheated on me, every girl, all the way back to eighth grade. I got my first girlfriend in eighth grade. She was a virgin. I was a virgin. Two weeks of us dating. She screwed some dude at the trailer park up the street. And I dated eight or 10 girls after that. Every single one cheated on me. And so I just had this mindset that, you know, people are just going to fucking leave you. And I acted like that in every relationship. Like, yeah, well, for however long you're here, this is great, you know, till you leave. <laughs> and if you're like that in a relationship, man, people go leave you because you're just a shitty person to be around, you know, and that's that's not on them. That's on you. And and I'm sorry, but like that's that's what it is. And you need to recognize it, man. You need to. If it's therapy, if it's medication, like whatever it is that's causing you to act that way, that's the solution is getting your head straight, you know? Good, Sorry, man. I talk for way too long. I feel like I'm I'm tuning you out. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is what it's about. This is when legends talk. You're the legend, <laughs> Lemon. You are the legend, okay? <laughs> I am I'm definitely the longest winded one. Uh, you're the first one, so we, we don't know Fair that. Fair enough. <laughs> But, Can't uh, wait till you have like I don't know Ben Shapiro on here. All right, call him next. Oh, <laughs> Legends. Man. Oh man. And um, just throwing this out there: if anybody, anybody, wants to come on here and share their story, contact me. If you know somebody who wants to get their story out there, contact me. All right, we'll do a Legends talk, and we'll have them or you featured. All right. Oh, you're more interested in Shin the Legend. Hey, you know, a day will come where I'm that big to where people want to interview me, all right? <laughs> but, um... We'll have to have a on mine. Oh. 
and do my podcast. Mine would be a lot more casual, I think. <laughs> but yeah, <clears throat> this is good too, man. I'm glad you started doing this. Honestly, I mean, I think it's a great thing you're doing. Yeah, I've been. Um, I actually been thinking about this for like a couple of months. Like when I was gone from streaming for a little bit after I was making my huge push, I call it. But um, yeah. when I came back, everybody showed me the love that they really missed me and you know hey where you been and I, people still care about me so you know i've been working a lot i made things made made a couple of changes so i could come back to doing this and um the first thing i wanted to do was this of course this is what i wanted to do and i knew exactly the first person who i wanted to do it with <laughs> You know? Well, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I, I, I really do appreciate you having me on. It's good to have you back streaming too. I think, I, I've always had a lot of respect for you. I mean, every time I've watched your stream, I've enjoyed it. You've always been a chill dude, so, you know, mm -hmm. happy to. All right, fellow fellow military member, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. So, you've been happy. So, what was the step? after your happiness and right now guys just to let you know we're we're bringing it all in we went through the good we're just at the end of the bad we're well we ended the bad would you say that pretty much man yeah i had i had one more instance you know like after after all this i stayed single for a bunch of years i had a girl who who pushed me to be in a relationship and i didn't really want to be in one um and then we ended up being together for like three years and she ended up cheating on me moving out. But see, this is, this is the weird part. And I guess it's worth telling the story just because it does sort of tie it all back in. So I go through all this therapy, I do medication and all that stuff. So here I am with this new girl, we're on the rocks, things aren't working out for like a year and, and we're sort of arguing back and forth. Um, and then I wake up one morning and her and my friend of 20 years are gone from the apartment and just gone. All their stuff's gone. Uh, while I was sleeping, they moved out together and I'd been friends with this guy for 20 years. You know, I'd, I'd, he was homeless at the time and I let him come live with me for free because I was like, dude, you ain't living on the street. You're my homie, you know? And yeah, I let him move in with me and I woke up one morning and him and my girlfriend were gone. And, you know, compared to how I responded the first two times, you know, like when I lost my first wife, I was devastated. You know, I was like really mentally pretty shook. And when I lost my second wife, I just told you the story. I was an uh, absolute mess. I lost all that weight. I got super depressed, going to kill myself, all that stuff. And when this happened, man, at this point, I was just like, peace, <laughs> you know, cool. If that's. If that's the kinds of people you are and and, you know, you didn't you didn't break my legs, you didn't steal my wallet, you just left and took your cool. Shit. Yeah, you it. took your shit and left. I'm, I'm cool. Um, I'm better off without you in my life. So, yeah, that that and that difference in mentality comes a lot from now, even though I'm not taking medication now, even though I probably should be. Um, I've been off my meds for like a year and I've been, I've been holding pretty okay. It's the first year ever actually that I've, I've been able to not take meds and not have like a terrible depressive relapse. Like pretty much every winter for the last three or four years, I've, I've noticed this from streaming cause you can see your stream schedule. Mm. Yeah. I can see it every January. Whoop, no more streams back in March. Whoop, no more streams back in March. Yeah. I began to realize it's it's cyclic for me. Every year I get super freaking depressed around around that part of the year. And um you know, just having that extra awareness and having at least felt happy before and having better tools in my bag for dealing with these problems when they come up with the ability to go, you know what? Her cheating on you isn't a reflection of you. Okay, that's not because you're a bad husband, your dick's small and you're ugly and you know, like it's it's not you, dude. It's really not your fault. Like people are gonna do whatever they're gonna do. And if you're thinking about it as your fault, then you're being selfish because you're thinking about it from your perspective. You need to remember everybody else is their own person, 
they all think the world revolves around them, them too. And in a way, it really does sorry, because Cosmic. at the end of the day, huh? I said I'm sorry, Cosmic. I just saw that. Oh, <laughs> oh God! I think I remember you telling me about this, Cosmic. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sometimes they're they're savage. I mean, with my last girlfriend too. You know, I said they didn't take my wallet. I did come home one day from the store a couple weeks later, and all my power strips were gone in the house. And I tried calling him. I'm like, did you motherfuckers come back into my house and take all my power strips? And I finally got a hold of my buddy or my ex buddy, Bobby. And I was like, do you take all my fucking power strips? He's like, well, Jasmine said they were hers. And I'm like, so you broke into my house and stole things because she said they were hers. Like, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> like for the camera, for the mic, dude. What? What was that? <laughs> like, yeah. O outside that. Yeah, man. These things, what happens with other people, it's not you. It doesn't define you. It doesn't have to define you. Your life circumstances never, ever have to define who you are and who you're going to be in this world. Don't ever let where you came from stop you or make you not, or make you even think that you're not capable of, of achieving literally anything you want to in this world, man. There are people who are born in the jungles of, of the Amazon who later on get PhDs and, and win Nobel prizes. Like th these kinds of things happen. It does not matter where you came from. It doesn't matter who you are. It don't matter nothing other than what you do. You know, I'm sorry to get all like motivational speech on you here, but like, I just, if we're closing it up, there are some final words I want to make sure people remember, no, you know? I mean, and these are the things that I've learned from all the shit that I've been through that people just said spend two hours listening to. Oh, yeah. I mean, make sure you get every word that you want to say out there, all right? Because it's going to be branded in the history of my YouTube. The history. It's going down to the books. It's going down I mean, books. that's that's really it, man. That's really it. Like, just... Remember, there's only ever going to be one person who's there for you 100% for sure until the day you die, and that's you. Okay, it ain't your kid, it ain't your mom, it ain't your wife, it ain't your girlfriend, it ain't your dad, it ain't your grandpa, it ain't your cousin. It's you. You're the only person who cannot leave you. Okay? So make sure you got you straight. Make sure you got your head straight. Make sure you got yourself taken care of, and then worry about other stuff. Oh, yeah. Because you can definitely get yourself strung out like like a dude on the rack in the year 1200 you know just completely distended and torn apart by letting other people pull you in different directions mm -hmm. so always remember to take care of yourself first all right and um are you streaming tonight lemon i'm actually not going to be i only got like three hours of sleep and i'm gonna tie that back in with me bitching earlier remember what i was saying like mm -hmm. i only got three hours of sleep i'm tired i'm gonna do that tonight because i'm a fucking civilian and i can <laughs> uh <laughs> but yeah uh i'm not gonna be streaming tonight i'm gonna be back on tomorrow night um yeah i'm just tired dude we've had a huge issue with the house we're trying to get a, a grant we're trying to get a fifty thousand dollar grant to pay off the house and they told us today like sorry you don't qualify and that means we're gonna have to sell our house within like two weeks because we can't afford the next payment so it's very hectic right now. Um, but I think we might be able to get this grant. And I've been just like no sleep in it trying to call people and get shit done to get this fixed. All right. So I need I need sleep tonight. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> mental um... health, man. <laughs> Here we go. Um, we'll do 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 a little bonus round. So, um... yeah, we haven't done Q&A yet. Yeah, we haven't done Q and A, but this is. I also wanted to hit on this. So, okay. Okay. Um, when in this period of time did you actually start streaming? Oh yeah, stream. Oh yeah, streaming. Uh, I started streaming in 2016. It was the early 2016. So after, uh, Jasmine and Bobby ran off together, um, I lost that apartment. And I end up selling pretty much everything I own. I moved everything I owned into a garage, like a, a basically a garage. It's a garage. I uh, moved everything I owned in there and was renting that while I was sleeping on my roommate or on a friend's couch and ended up selling pretty much everything out of the storage unit. Like I sold my TV. I sold all my furniture. I sold my bed. I sold like everything. I sold everything I owned. I'm like, dude, I'm going 
like Gandhi style monk. Like I'm gonna wander the streets wearing a robe nowadays. <laughs> like I'm done <laughs> with society. Uh, and I went to a programming boot camp, finished that up. And while I was looking for work in the programming world, I started streaming. I was like, I was playing a lot of League of Legends, and I was like, dude, I gotta. I'd heard of Twitch, but I'd never like been on Twitch or watched Twitch or anything like that. So I'd heard that there was a platform where you could stream video games. And I was like, dude, if I, if I'm at least streaming video games, I can at least like tell my dad that I'm not just sitting around playing video games. Like I'm, I'm growing an online business, like something like that, you know, just so I could use it as an excuse to play League of Legends. And so that's what I did. I started playing League 48 hours a week. I was doing eight hours a day, six days a week. And it was a lot of streaming to absolutely nobody, man. I mean, I I spent probably my first five to six hundred hours streaming to literally nobody or one or two people who, you know, you know how it is when you have like one or two people like nobody talks. They'll say hi and then, then it's quiet. There's nothing wrong with that for anybody who's like that. Just it's not until you get like 10 to 15 average viewers usually that you have somebody to talk to constantly up till that point. It's very spotty. So but. What I finally realized is it gave me a wonderful opportunity to learn how to get people's attention because all that time spent with nobody listening, I could just say things. I'd be like, I rode a, uh, I rode a school bus today on top of it and I was in my underwear and just like, you know, go like with random stories like this that are just nonsensical until somebody in chat makes an emote. And I'm like, that's it. That's what gets them. Okay. Mental note. And then, you know, like every time chat starts falling off, I'd, I'd do like, well, I love wearing girls' panties, man. Like that's who lacy ones, pink, hot pink. Like they feel good against my skin, you know, just like finding random stuff to say that, that gets people's attention and, and gets people talking and doing that enough. I mean, granted, that's not a good long term solution for content, but it got me one comfortable with just saying ridiculous stuff and being comfortable talking um, because I'm never afraid of what I'm going to say nowadays because of that. And two, uh, it it oh, it gave me the creative skills to come up with like more interesting things to talk about, no matter what's going on, like whether somebody's there or not. Because that was something I realized, too, when I was when I had that summer in 2018, when my stream started getting, getting a little bit bigger, you know, 100 plus viewers every stream. Um, I realized that you have the same issue. You have the exact same issue as when you start. When you have 100 viewers in your chat, you can't read chat. You have no chat. It's gone. Like, it's just going and going and nobody's talking to you. And you can you can respond to them and nobody will say a word and be like, oh, hey, spicy. It's good to see you in here tonight. And she just ignores you and keeps talking to other people. And you're like, dude, I'm alone. You're just back to being alone. And so I realized like that that initial stage of streaming is actually really crucial for the long term growth and getting those skills down. I don't even know what started me on this tangent, dude, but this is what I'm talking about. Like streaming to nobody has got me the ability to tangent endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd like to say, do you remember, um, we talked about this, you probably remember now, but um, around this same time, a year ago, you did an interview on NL Mark. I do. I wish I had saved it, but yes, I do remember it. All right. Um, let's see. I was probably in the streaming game since 2014. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like, and I was streaming to nobody. I got discouraged, you know, some stuff in my, some stuff in my life had happened. You know, that would be another two hours to explain that. <laughs> but, um, I was down and, you know, um, my buddy Game Geezer, he was like, hey, you know, you should watch Lemon Pops. He's really good at Rocket League. I was like, okay, you know. So I think I hosted you one night, you know, after I was done with a stream. And then I started watching you little by little, just sitting there lurking. And then you did this interview. And I remember this interview because I was sitting at my job 
in a room with no windows. I was just sitting there with 18 <laughs> computer screens, no windows. And I was like, man, like this, this is rough right now. And that mm. interview right there, that interview you had with NL Mark probably changed my whole streaming game. Like how so? Like you like it uplifted me. Like, you know, just hearing the tale of NL Mark and, you know, having you like do the interview, I was like, man, like I, these guys are real down to earth. You know, because when I first came into streaming, I was like, I'm looking at it. I was like, I can do that. <laughs> I don't know how, but I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. Like, you know, and then it's like at this time, I probably I didn't even have a sub button. I like I stood <laughs> like you, 2015 slash 14. And yeah, the, the, there wasn't even sub button then. Yeah. And then. Here we are, 2019. I don't have a sub button still. Like, I'm still just... You got a sub button? What are you talking about? No, I got my sub button. Hold on, is it 2008? See, look, now I'm just... Oh, wait, am I thinking the wrong yeah. year? No, oh, yeah. Okay. I got my sub button after the interview. All right? I so, gotcha. Okay. So, when I saw that interview, I was like, man, you know, these guys, like... You sit here, and I watch your streams. I watch NL Mark streams, and I was like, okay, I know what I need to do now, you know? And then, Man, sometimes <laughs> you have those people you meet where where suddenly it it all makes sense, you know? Because I've seen a lot of streamers where I'm like, I don't, I, I that ain't me, man. Like, that, that guy up there, that ain't my thing. Like, that would never be my thing. But I got that same impression from you, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you there again. I'm terrible at that. But the uh, sometimes you just meet people that that speak to you just right, you know, and you're one of those people like you're a super chill guy, like you're laid back. And and that's cool, man. You can be successful being that like not everybody. Everybody gets in their head that they got to be this this like over the top, like crazy psycho nut job that that screams and breaks stuff. And yeah, game geezer, (laughs) sexy man himself. Oh, man. Just talking about you. Hmm. And um, truthfully, Game Geek, that guy right there is um, the reason I got back into streaming because he gave me equipment. So instead of me streaming off my Xbox and my PS4, Geezer's like, here's a capture card. You could use your oh. laptop. It, ha- nice. it has some good specs on it, all right? It's good enough. To get you started. It's good enough to stream. So he came over and you know helped your boy out, but you know you like you and NL Mark were like the ones who got me rolling to where I was like, I don't need to be this guy. I don't need to be that guy. I don't need to be this other famous guy. Be yourself. Be yourself. <laughs> and people will come and watch just be yourself yeah it's a little harder to grow it's a little slower but yeah like at the end of the day what are you doing this for are you doing this for because you want to be a millionaire if, dude if you want to be a millionaire like go do something else you know like if you want to grow a community you want it to be as easy as breathing for you in my opinion and that's just my opinion some people like to approach it like a job and you know do 70 hours a week and make a schedule and all that stuff. But for me, like if I wanted a schedule, if I wanted a job, I'd go get a motherfucking job. And this is more about a way of life and showing other people that, that you, you can achieve your dreams. You know, you don't have to change. You don't have to compromise who you are. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, also it's like when you said building a community. When you build a community, you want it to be your community, right? Not, not not the fake person that you are, because they're watching somebody, and then here you are in your Discord, and you're totally somebody else. It's like, well, this ain't the guy I'm watching. Who are you? Right. Like. Yeah, yeah. Some people are just so fake, man. So, are they only in it for themselves, or they only want money, or they only want fame, or they want partner? You know, like. 
I get that. Every fucking streamer wants partner, you know, like, and every viewer knows every streamer wants partner. Like, yeah. granted, there's some like small benefits to reminding people, you know, and like they may remember to show up more often or something like that. But like, ultimately, if people want to watch you, they will. And if people want to support you, they will. And and you shouldn't have to beg for it or pressure people or shove people into a corner to try to like beat them out of money so you can have what you want. That's like the most selfish approach mm -hmm. that I just feel is terribly unsuccessful. Very for most, I have seen people succeed with it. This is the freaking problem. And you've been streaming a long time too, it sounds like. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people come. Oh, yeah. And dude, there are some people who do it. They were like, give me your money. And, or get out or I'm shutting my cam off and people just give them money. And you're like, how, why would you give this person money? Some people are into that, you know, like I can't fault anybody's game on how they approach streaming. The Dama but Twitch for me, it's... say it again. The Dama Twitch. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. And I can't fault anybody else for how they stream, but it just ain't for me. Uh, that way ain't for me. You know, yeah. I want to have a real connection with people. That's what I'm in this for. Like, somebody would donate five dollars to me and i'll probably still get emotional because that's your hard-earned money I, I, at least i think your hard-earned money given to me so like um uh, i don't know i think it was two streams ago two streams ago i was just getting sub after sub after sub after sub and then some like we got a waifu now we have a waifu for our channel her name is sylvia and, oh, um, she donated a whole bunch of gift subs, so I'm going to put it up and she is the waifu of the chat drawn by her herself. And like, you know, like this, this is the wow. type of stuff like, you know, like stuff like that really hits me and it hits me hard and I'm a big baby. So, like, I'll get teary-eyed and emotional and stuff like that. Like, it's just me. Like, that's how I get. So, it's like, like, people who donate, people who sub to me, like, I'd be like, man, you know, thank you very much to where my gameplay or whatever I'm playing or whatever I'm doing is, like, it's just down the drain. It's like, oh, he was playing good. <laughs> now look at him. <clears throat> Piece of shit, Sweet. Why do if I Why do I even watch this guy? Hey, sweets. Yeah. Dude, I've always been torn on, on donations and things like that. Like, I, because I understand, kind of like you were saying, too, somebody giving you five bucks, like, it meaning a lot. Um, I've been, I, I've been in that position where, like, my last dollar I give to somebody else, you know? And sometimes people look at it and they're like, oh, thanks for the buck, man. And other times, you know, and, and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, like, dude, that was literally the only dollar I had in this world. Like, I gave you 100% of my net worth. Yeah. Like, that's what you meant to me today. And you're going to tr treat it like it's just a buck, you know? Um, so I I don't try to act any sort of way when it comes to to getting donations or anything like that. And I'm sure you've noticed that because I mean, shit, I think you dropped like a 15 on me the other day. Like, I, I never know what to say, so, but um, thank you, you know? I think um, it was three of you. I hit um, I hit Hulu on his anniversary. I think I hit him for 15 or 20. I hit you for 15 or 20. Um, and I hit, um, her name's with a M. It's with a M. Morgasm? I think it was Morgasm. I hit Morgasm with 10. With 10. Yeah. And I, you know, I was like, I wonder That's if That's super they, cool you, man. I was like, I wonder if they picked up the trail, you know, like the trail. Because I was like, you know, I've been watching you guys for a long time. You know, I I almost said something about it that night because you came and dropped those on me. And I'm like, dude, Kulu's anniversary stream's going on like right now. Like... I hope he didn't just like come over and do this for me and not Kulu. You know, I'd feel kind of bad for Kulu, but it, it makes me feel better knowing that you hit us both. You know, I felt, I don't know. I just felt weird, but I, I of course appreciate it, man. You know, oh, I yeah. do. Well, cause so. like, like I wasn't streaming for so long cause I was working so much. And like, if you guys seen the way I put together my room right now, like 
I got a 65 <laughs> inch TV on the fucking wall right now. Like, <laughs> I'm about to in buy this little it. room. Yeah, it's like it must be the size of the room, dude. Man, like my whole wall is took right here. So when I start streaming again, <laughs> you're just gonna be seeing me going like this. You'd be like, "What up, chat?" And yeah. It's like, <laughs> And it's like, I got the little mount, it moves, everything holds the PlayStation and the damn Xbox. So it's like, man, and I'm looking at myself and all I hear is, um, all I hear is T.I. Oh, you fancy, huh? Oh, you fancy. That, that's, that's how, that's how I feel it. So, yeah. you know, like I've been working hard. That's why I've been away from streaming. But like, do I need all that money? No, I don't. So why not come back to something I love instead of like working my ass off from six in the morning to three a.m. at night to be back up at six in the morning? I was working yeah. three jobs, so you know three? three. You were out here working three jobs, three man. Jobs. So yeah, you don't need that much money. I mean, maybe you do. I don't know, but I mean, I wouldn't. Like, I wouldn't need that much. If you guys have seen, like, I don't come out to my stream looking like Wolverine. So, like, I like to be clean cut, and I haven't had that in a very, very long time. It's kind of funny how I kept Just one of my no jobs time. like that. Yeah, so, me and the dude had a heart and heart, and I was like, either I work here one or two days a week, or you can just fire me. Yeah. What'd he say? <laughs> He's like good luck man you know thank you blah 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 good luck all right peace and um he's like i wouldn't want you to do that don't do that to yourself but he was cool about it but the higher ups on the other hand oh yeah we terminated you because you were lacking <laughs> and i was like oh, oh of course <laughs> yeah i was like okay try to hit you that i was like cool i was like but when i collect unemployment on you then yeah it's terrible you know but i still need money right but dude unemployment's weird i mean that that'd be a whole other topic oh I yeah think we ran way over already all right so or a um, little over shall we hit the q and a's yeah all right yeah same thing um q and a's guys go ahead and write your question in the chat and i will pick one to ask lemon don't be writing hella questions and you know because like the chat does go up so i think i'll be like how many toes do you have <laughs> why do you smile <laughs> do you have a beach ball <laughs> oh awesome um like um because i work in real mm. estate right now um so really like my hours are like as long as i have work coming in then i work it but like really like doing the paperwork and stuff how i do it it's not too hard to have a 11 to 5 mm. and then be done for the day because everything's a day turnaround too and not to mention like if i really wanted to stream i was like okay i'm gonna put this aside you know because it's not important I could put this aside and then just do it a little bit. Sugar Ray, are you asking him or me? All or right, both of us. So we'll start with Sugar Ray, or even Awesome Death. Actually, I was first. Oh, one. well, I just explained that to Awesome Death. So you, oh, okay. You're, you're, well, you got a full time job, Lemon. I do not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Sugar Ray then. Sugar Ray. Yeah. Uh, what is one thing you wish to change in your past? Um, I guess we we can both answer it. Or okay. He said. I don't know. I mean, if he wants it for you, Lemon, go ahead. The one thing I can change my past, honestly, that's always a tough one, you know, because thinking about changing anything would change who I am today. And I'm pretty happy with who I've come out to be. And I feel that any particular instance that was awful or where I made a mistake ultimately came out better in the end. Any sort of like, Oh, I 
fucked up and punched a hole in a wall while getting in a fight with my girlfriend and she left me like damn man i really wish i hadn't done that like well but everything that's happened since then wouldn't have happened had i not been a dumb shit and done that you know like never hit a girl or anything like that just like i don't know like random shit like that like oh man if i hadn't gone to that party and gotten drunk uh something something would have never happened like i don't really regret anything that happened to me anymore i don't really hold that same feeling about it that i used to it doesn't impact me it's more of like a story i tell at this point it's something that i've disconnected from and it was a different person practically because there was the me before i i had that revelation at 27 and was going to kill myself and there's the me after and the me after is a totally different person although a much lazier one and god do i hate that because <laughs> if there's one thing i can change about myself now it would be to have just a little bit of that hard ass sergeant back in me because i lost that completely when i when i threw everything to the wind and said screw it let jesus take the wheel i'm gonna just live and exist and learn about myself i i really dropped my discipline man so as far as that like i do wish i still had that in me um more than i do now like more readily available than i do now but i know i still got it somewhere in me okay <clears throat> i was sugar ray quan nope Pajama Joe, um, this is for you, Lemon. Might have missed it, but what years did you guys serve? Well, I mean, he did put guys, but come on, Joe. I served with you. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, funny. I got a guy in my chat who, who was in basic training with me, too. That's, that's weird that we both have people in our chats that were with us when we served. Yeah. Well, when, we <laughs> hit the, when I hit the Victor unit, that's where I met Joe. I gotcha. We, when we, did you get out, Shin? 2011. And you were in four years? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I was in from 2005 till 2012. That's when I got out. And to be fair, most of 2012, I wasn't really in. I was I was in the ING, the Active National Guard. So I went like twice that year and that was it. <clears throat> All right, um, Shikigami, what's the best advice you can give based on what you've been through? Like I said earlier, man, just really remember that, and I know it sounds dark, like, and everybody take into account that I'm a nihilist. I came out of this a nihilist, okay? So I don't have the rosiest outlook on life. Um, I came out, and again, this isn't necessarily the right way to look at the world. This is one philosophy of many, and I'm using a lot of disclaimers here so that nobody else follows my line of thinking because I really don't encourage it. But I'm a nihilist, and I really do feel that nothing we do in this life matters at all. I think that we die, our flesh rots, and that's it. Like, <laughs> we cease to exist in the memories of those around us, and those people die, and then the Earth dies, and then the solar system dies, and a billion years from now you know nobody ever even knew we existed like it's all meaningless it doesn't matter so uh given that nothing matters though in my perspective again i i think the best advice i could give anybody is to remember that the main purpose of living at least in my eyes is for the experience that you have while you're here whatever you're experiencing whether it's good or bad or neutral or whatever it is it's an experience that only one skin sack being jellyfish walking creature will ever experience ever most likely in a non-infinite universe so if that's the case your purpose your your purpose if one could be said to have a purpose would be to be the only vessel to ever experience what you're experiencing and you should at least respect that no matter whether it's good or bad or ugly or amazing that you go through in life it's got value and you, like a, god it's so hard to to find the right words for it but even when things are going bad um remember that it's just one experience of the overall story that will be your total creation 
if that makes sense. Keep it in perspective, I guess is probably a lighter way of saying that. All right. Um, that was Shikigami, right? All right. I believe so, yeah. <clears throat> okay. From Quan. Do you still think you're desynchronized? Oh, desensitized? Oh, desensitized. My fault. The arrow is covering a lot of things here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do I think I'm desensitized? Yes, I do. I think that the amount of negative experiences I had as a kid, I think that the stuff in the military, the kinds of things you see and hear and go through, um, as well as all the other negative experiences I've had in my life, very little is left in this world to get at me at this point. Like you, you really can't touch me anymore. Like, and, and very few things get through to me. And it's actually been a little unnerving lately how how disassociated I've felt. Like, I've wondered if I'm in a manic state right now lately because I've been like, huh, yeah, I just really don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> like some things in life lately. But, um, yeah, I think, I think I'm totally desensitized in a lot of different ways that a lot of people aren't. And I think that it's important to be self-aware of that for, for myself. Like, me personally, I like to at least be aware of the fact that I'm desensitized to things so that when I come across a topic or um, a situation that requires more tact, I can at least realize that it's the time to use it or that maybe what I'm saying isn't appropriate for the situation. Although it, it's more of like an afterthought than anything like, Oh yeah, I bet you other people would probably not like it if I, you know, talked about awful racist stuff you know like it's like all sorts of things that that yeah all right were you were you done with that question lemon what's that were you done with that question oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay <clears throat> uh, thank you chic chicky chicky gammy yeah uh um uh... Okay, Sugar Ray. Um, one thing I would change about the past, like I'll have to go with Lemon on this. Like, if we would change, probably like one little change from the past, and this day would have never happened. You know, you guys probably wouldn't meet me. I would probably be streaming at a different schedule. You know, I probably won't be watching Lemon Pops as much. Like any little thing like would probably be different right now so i wouldn't change a thing as of right now because right now at this point i'm in a i'm in a part of my life that i'm getting better and i'm helping a lot of people out there get better so right now i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing all right any more questions everybody was graduating high school by the time I got out. Jesus. Yeah, that's a weird amount of timing. 2011, you're graduate. Yeah, I graduated high school in 2003, I think it was. Uh, I was 06. 06? Yeah. We're spaced out a little bit, it looks like. Yeah, we was. <clears throat> just a little bit. But yeah. funny thing is, before I left... <laughs> Pearl Circle... <laughs> All right. If you could change, if you can change your past, would you have streamed on Mixer? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have. Um, <laughs> we'll just say I streamed on Mixer for a little bit. I didn't like it. I, I it wasn't for me, and I'm kind it was of, too gimmicky, man. Yeah, it was. It was too too many things to do, and I was like, that's. Not what I want. And I streamed on Mixer. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Finish finish the story. No, I was just saying I just didn't like it overall. My cousin is like, we need to get on this Mixer thing. Like, they got Ninja. And I told you about this and blah, blah, blah. And then, like, six months later, like, Mixer shut down. <laughs> and I yep. was like, mm, good thing I ain't going to Mixer, right? 
Yeah, dude. I, I found out about Mixer because back when I went into streaming, I was looking at all the different streaming platforms out there and all the different opportunities. And I did stream on Mixer a little bit, but I also did, God, what did I do? I did like live stream dot me. I did uh, D live. I tried all kinds of things. Um, Beam when it was Beam before it became Mixer, I was streaming on there too. But yeah, what I realized though, when I started doing the restream IO thing that all the streamers do, I realized that what happens is you create two separate audiences, man. Like you get three people over here on Mixer that want to see your stream every day, and you get three people over here on Twitch that want to see your stream every day, and they ain't going to go to the other platform. So what do you do? You know, like, do you keep streaming forever on both platforms and talking in two chats? Do you, do you try to convince them? Like, it just didn't seem like a long-term sustainable thing. And once you get affiliate on Twitch anyway, you got to stop doing that. So I was like, dude, it's it's a waste of time. At least dual streaming. Yeah. And also with that, um, <clears throat> I realized early in the, the Mixer game, there there's not enough viewers to share on Mixer no at all so like you're you get your top people right it would be like 4600 people with this person then 500 with this person and then the next person would be like five and i was like yep where where, where the fuck is the ratio at where and there's eight total streamers <laughs> like <laughs> damn <it's> like, okay <clears throat> I was like, sorry, it's not meant for me because, you know, Twitch Twitch has the majority. Like, um, this Mixer wasn't going to be a Facebook to Twitch's MySpace, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's that's how I saw it. I was like, yeah, this, this is not going to overtake it unless I see more numbers. And those numbers were consistent for, like, a couple of years until Shroud and Ninja changed over. Now they got the highest things, you know, their numbers are up there. And then the next person you'll see is 200 and yep. three. So it's like, uh, <laughs> all right. I, I got time for one last question here. So, all right. It looks like that is the last question right there at the end. Let's do one more after yeah. this, Lemon. Can you do one more after that? I can do one more. All right. So, okay. <laughs> where did you get the name Lemon Pops? So, I had I had always used the name. Here, I'll just type it in chat so you can see. It was Caconius, like this, when I started streaming on Twitch. And I would show up in people's chat, and they'd be like, Oh, hey, <laughs> Uh, co co coco coco what's up coco how are you man and i'm sitting here with my name like dude nobody knows how to say this and i started thinking about it. i'm like dude i don't even know how to say this this is like some auto-generated yahoo name from 1999 that i had there <laughs> cc won us so <laughs> yeah i um I had to come up with a new username and I'd never come up with another username in my whole entire life. And I had a bottle of Snapple, lemon Snapple sitting on my desk. And I was like, Snapple lemon pop. There we go. Easy name. And so I was going to do that. I started thinking about it though, over a couple months. I'm like, dude, you can't put Snapple in your name though. Like it's trademarked. It's like Walmart pops or Les Schwab pops. Like you can't, you can't like, toaster strudel pops you know you can't you can't just shove somebody else's brand name in the middle of your name so i decided on lemon pop and lemon pop was taken on twitch and so i went to lemon pops with an s and it was taken on twitch and so i went with this fucking edgelord name of lemon pops with a z because i'm edgy and cool now i'm the cool dad <laughs> with the z in his name so yeah <laughs> so that's how i got lemon pops it was uh my lawyer helped me come up with it let's just say <laughs> due to legal reasons i mean you got the lemon heart in the background over there that's true kwan made me this this is from kwan oh. she made this for me so all right um we got time for one more question you guys better get out and get me a question a good one 
I asked Lemon for one more question. Somebody better come up with one more question. Somebody. I'm a 36B, just in case anybody wondered about that one. I'll save you a question. Ooh. Cool that. So. Final round. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. The doors are closed, ladies and gentlemen. The doors are closed. Give him the zinger. Oh, oh, oh. When is the IRL? Where do you live, man? State wise. Aren't you in the Northwest? We could meet up. We could do something. I have like a 200 mile range. If you have a 200 mile range, we could possibly touch tips. Mm. Um. Speaking of, um, when I go down to Oregon, Lemon, we gotta we gotta get together. We do, we do. You gotta hit me up when you come down here. Yeah. Um, shoot, when was the last time I was down there a year ago? Been a year? Yeah. I was down there during Man. Christmas time. <clears throat> gotcha. Well, we have these great protests going on in Portland. Like we could just totally meet up there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I hear it's a fun place to be. It's like a whole party going on. They got the blocks blocked off. You know, it's like a big, great time. Hey, I mean, um, <laughs> me and my boy, um, which is an old military buddy, um, we like drinking Mickey's. You know, we can sit there and watch the town burn. Hey, there we go. That'd be a good time. Drink, drink some. Mickey's. Cheers. We'll bring some lawn chairs and we'll set up with some cameras and we'll just IRL stream it from downtown Portland. We'll get like, mm, dude, man. what do you think they'd do? I, because I am not even kidding. I am totally down to do that. I will go to the middle of a fucking protest and set up lawn chairs on a table and 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 pour some mai tais and a little umbrella and we can sit there and talk. Because oh, I bet you that will change the mood of the people around us. Exactly. You know, we'll just set up a talk show right in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. man. All right couple of ice chests and some coolers yeah. yeah dude we'll we'll do this like a tailgater yeah what, what should what should we call it the pop shinnets oh man we'll have to come up with a good name yeah. we'll we'll get a banner but nothing too political because that would probably be a bad idea well, like no this is totally unrelated to anything that's going on around well, we're just here to do our thing we could, <laughs> we could be the double l's the lemon legends oh that could be Double L's. They'll start talking about us on Fox, though. They'll be like, a new Antifa group has sprung up in Portland, Oregon today, known as the Double L's. You can see them marching, and you just see us sitting there just like... sitting there. He was like, hey, you want one? Uh, uh. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. That's how we get got. Hold it. Right, man? All right. I, I've really got to go. I'm sorry to, to cut it, but... I, I do have to run. Nah, that's okay. I got to get to the store here in just a minute. So, <laughs> all right, guys. Um, thank you guys for all coming out and um, sitting here and watching Lemon tell a story. Um, in the last words, Lemon. I appreciate y'all for coming out. Definitely follow this guy if you haven't followed him already. Shin the Legend, I believe his name is, and we're in a stream. So if you're not already following, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> all right, and we're out, guys. Peace. <laughs>